So guys what if Naruto x Kuroka x Akino Harem movie? A world believed to either lie below what is deemed the human world or is in fact a world beyond the dimensional ties of Earth. This theory has been given great thought by great factions of life and separate mythology. The underworld is roughly the size of the human world. Except for its absence of large bodies of water, such as oceans, rivers and lakes appeared frequently across the vast expanse of land that made up the underworld, to be certain, but all traces of oceanic life seem to have evaporated many millennia ago, regardless, vast amounts of flora and fauna were prevalent on the surface, this is, ironically, a subject of controversy amongst humans, who have spread ill-informed rumors about its makeup being that of fire and brimstone. It would have been humorous if it weren't said with such harshness. Life grew, expanded and, with some, developed sentience from this deemed underworld, the most prevalent of these races was that of the race that would be called the devils, of important note, this race was not originally called devils in their creation, their original name was lost to history, as gradually those of other natures and races began to call them as what they are known to today and the devils accepted their new title with enthusiasm. The devils were very much human in appearance or, depending on whom you ask, the humans were very devil in appearance, four limbs, bipedal, five fingers and toes, complex immune systems, sexual dimorphism and so on, if one were to stand a group of humans and devils together, side by side, it would be a surprise if he or she managed to tell one apart by appearance alone. Aside from humans, however, devils were unique in how they separated themselves from humans. Devils held immense amounts of strength, speed, stamina, high magical influence and, over time, the ability to fly, even their intelligence and innovation seemed to be above those of humans in the early ages, whether it was evolution or some mythical force that might have been the cause behind such advancements in the devil race, but it was undeniable that the average devil held vast amounts of power over an average human. These superiorities only grew, with many developing strange abilities singular to a family or race, and once discovery of the human world became known to the devils, which they were capable of traveling back and forth from with the use of techniques they developed between the two realms, that is where the most well-known of tales between the devils and the humans began. Devils discovered the humans, discovered their dominance over the creatures that had only begun to develop into a race of some note, to the devils, they only saw a species that might have been of some use in advancing and continuing their prevalence in the world, now worlds. Among these great conquerors of humans, there stood the great generals of devils, Lucifer, Leviathan, Beelzebub, Asmodeus. These devils, known as the four great satans, stood at the top of the food chain leading the proud 72 pillars of the devilkind in the hopes of conquering this new world as their own. The fate of humanity might have ended as quickly as it had begun, few could stand against the onslaught of devils, those who attempted to press against the devils died, it was a message that their invasion was not to be challenged. Those were dark days in human, forgotten history. It was amongst the enslaving and the conquering and the death that the devils became known to others, others who would shake the foundation of devil and humankind for millennia to come, they were known as the angels. Angels. The originators of heaven. Their home, angels were powerful, winged beings, similar, in fact, to the appearance of humans and devils, they descended from the skies in blinding lights to prevent the increased empirical movements of the devils, they attacked with powers that were formed with light and held strong capability in harming the devil kind, gifted by their father, who is known today as God, the angels engaged the devils in a war unlike any other. A war that would last for millennia to come, those were the years known as the Great War, the four great satans fell in battle, the seventy-two pillars lost great strength, a faction of angels, disillusioned with the perfection that angelkind held themselves at, formed amongst the human realm and devilkind, effectively named the fallen angels. No side was left undamaged, their very foundations left them on the brink of collapse, it was by the judgment of these groups, officially known as the three factions, that the war could go on no longer, an uneasy ceasefire was forged a stalemate to end the death and ruin of all worlds. No peace was made, not yet, too much bad blood between all groups involved. Now, what does this have to do with the story that will be told, you might be asking. Well, if you are still interested, perhaps this story of conflict, hardships, renewed life and perhaps, if you're lucky, even a little romance might tie up some loose questions you might ask. The story is that of a once dead Naruto Uzumaki, his story lied before the angel and devil's conflict, long, long before, his time passed, but now, it must start over again. For the throne atop the tower must be sat upon again. In the vast cities of the Gremory territory of the underworld. The stone buildings and skyscrapers glowed beneath the moon in the night sky. The cities of Gremory House were proud monikers of their wealth and power. 
Several hexagonally formed cities could be seen all around vast forested areas, if one were to take a scenic route upwards and look down upon the amazement of the cities below, so perfectly lined with brightened roads and transit areas made it all seem like some gleaming snowflake amongst green grass, without question, the House of Gremory's power was, as befitting one of the remaining original 72 pillars, undoubtedly an impressive sight to be viewed. But this is not where the story takes place, just outside the territory of this metropolis of metropolises, two travelers, Sears X Lucifer and his queen, Graphia Lucifuge, made quickened steps towards an as of yet unknown destination. Sears X Lucifer was a handsome man of young appearance, with shoulder length crimson hair, fair skin, and blue green eyes. His appearance was actually quite similar to those of the main family of the Gremory territory. The reason being was that the man was a former household member before being appointed as one of the new leaders of the devil race some time ago. He wore long, flowing robes of gold and silver that matched his stance and stature as that of a noble man. Truthfully, Sears X Lucifer might have been considered by many as the devil king, if not for the shared position among three others of similar rank. The woman beside him, Graphia Lucifuge, was the beautiful beyond all doubt, similar to Sears X, she seemed quite young in appearance, with thick silver hair that reached down her back in an elegant braid, matching eyes that gleamed even in the dimly lit forest, and fair skin as pale as the moon above. Graphia was a woman of exquisite appearance. But that was only her physical features, in contrast to Sears X. Graphia's desired dress was formal but hardly showed the devil in any sort of position of power, a blue and white outfit, almost indistinguishable to those worn by maids in service to the human world's European states, was worn by her from head to toe, while certainly this was not the most unusual of dresses, and it certainly was modest by all accounts, the way she wore it along with the cool expression on her face made her seem almost similar to a doll. Indeed, looking at the pair of devils walking so far from the comfort of their fellow kind and not knowing their reputation or relationship, one might have assumed they were master and servant, and in a way, they were. Graphia liked to do chores that would befit someone of her dress, she was the ideal professional when it came to being a maid, but there was something that separated her from just being any maid employed to Sears X Lucifer, one of the four great satans of the underworld and ultimate level devil. And that was because she and Sears X Lucifer were married. Indeed, the two were very much in love and very much husband and wife, married after a war of conflict amongst the devils, these two were the stuff of romantic tales and gossip, their union was something that was none too dissimilar to the tales of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, though with a much happier ending. Of note, their love was so well published and recognized throughout the underworld that even a movie was made based around their love. But this is a deviation from current events, walking around tree and bush, with little light beside them except for a glowing orb of magic courtesy of Graphia, as was proper. The two made their way to a select destination. Sears X smiled as his eyes followed the direction of the map in his hands, we're close now, he whispered, just a little further and well be there, Graphia nodded, saying nothing and keeping her thoughts to herself. This wasn't exactly how one expected to spend an evening, especially a free one from the duties of being a great Satan, the two had originally decided to come into one of the Gremory cities for a nice dinner and perhaps a show to spend the evening with one another, a standard, simple night, it would be nice, pleasant and perhaps with a little bit of enjoyment after the night was finished and over. What she, perhaps, should have expected was her husband's innate ability to be sidetracked. To make a long story short, they traveled through the market area that evening, shop owners asked to purchase their mystic goods in one form or another, nothing exceptional could be seen by either of them so they simply enjoyed their presence, together. Then came the peddler, this, this, this what you buy, he shouted, running up to them both, holding the parchment her husband currently had great interest in, big grave. Yes, big indeed, very important, important thing inside, very important. The peddler pushed the parchment into Sears X chest, surprising them both, did the man not know who they were? Five gold coin. Important, need coin to work. Find and you keep inside. So Sears X purchased the parchment. Well, he said, smiling to his confused wife as the peddler giggled madly to the side, how do you feel about a treasure hunt? She didn't mind, of course, she was proper that way, she enjoyed her husband's enthusiasm, even when he claimed that it wouldn't have been much of a challenge if they simply teleported or even flew to the location, no, he needed the walk, he said, so now, here they were, in the middle of the forest, chasing a hoax of a map to a location neither were familiar with. It was to Sears X excitement and Grayfi's surprise when, Upon reaching the location pointed on their map, the two actually came onto something, unusual. It wasn't so much a grave, as the peddler called what they would find, rather, holding itself high in the center of the small clearing, was a large tomb of sorts, big, 
gray and made hard stone, it stood tall in front of them, its doors closed and appearing to not have been opened for quite a long time, Grafia marveled slightly at the structure. It was very old, just looking at it, she could tell it was older than perhaps even Lord Gremory, her husband and Lord's father, even graves made out to ancient devilkind weren't as simple as the stone structure in front of the pair, with any other grave or marker, there would be some indication of what was the purpose of the work or to which family or territory it belonged to. This tomb was nothing, no markings or symbols, just placed stone. Sirzex was shaking, I am gonna check it out. He raced towards the two stone doors that led down into the tomb, looking them over before starting to give them a push. Grafia walked over to him, bringing the light orb, my lord, do you believe this wise? She wasn't one to question him but this seemed eerie, a monument like this, so close to Gremory territory, undiscovered. This feels, she tried to find the words, uneasy. Oh, come on. Sirzex continued to push the doors apart, it required more effort than he thought two doors made of only stone would require. Where's your sense of adventure? To humans, grave robbing or entering a tomb such as this might have been a bad taboo. Not to devils, though, they were creatures of passions and desires, this untouched tomb screamed to be explored from the usually well-kept Lucifer. With a final push and the shaking of some loose dust, the doors were finally opened, the doors opened to reveal a stone staircase leading down to somewhere unlit by even the moon or the light orb, dust and cobwebs were prevalent as far as they could see. Sirzex smiled, looking back to his wife, it'll be back before you know it, he said, waving his hand as his own version of a ball of light, red in color but still shining with light, formed at his side, just wait out here, it'll bring you back something nice. Then he descended, leaving Grafia to watch quietly above. Sirzex did not consider himself a tomb seeker by any stretch, most of his sense of adventure had been doused during the civil war between the old Satan faction and the anti Satan faction, now his sense of enjoyment pertained to the idea of peace and continued prosperity of his devilkind, he smiled every morning, knowing his kind would see another day, free from the former terror that their world might come to an end. But that did not mean the work was done. Repairs were still being made from the two major wars that plagued the devils, they could not afford to be weak or stand separate from one another, he had a job to do, a job of significant importance, but he realized soon into his new responsibilities as a great Satan that, if he didn't take time to enjoy and relax around the company of others, the name of Lucifer would crush him. That was why this new adventure enthralled him, this tomb was remarkably simple and fascinating to someone who believed he had seen every wonder of the underworld. Where had such a treat been hiding, he wondered, and so close to his father's realm. It was these thoughts that distracted him long enough to not notice when his foot tapped on a certain stone and a small click was heard. Slam. The walls around Sirzex broke from their foundations and smashed into one another, effectively crushing Sirzex and his ball of light, it was so sudden, so quick. Sirzex had little time to do more than widen his eyes in surprise before being squished effectively between stone. There was a quiet to the tomb. The trap's old machinations ticked to a stop next to the walls, their duty complete in stopping all trespassers. Then a shaking around the walls could be heard, it slowly increased in volume and rapidity, showering dust around the empty staircase, before a fair-skinned hand busted out from the compressed together walls. The hand pressed forward, an arm followed, then a torso, then the rest of the body. Sirzex Lucifer, smirking and brushing off loose dust from his cloak, chuckled as his light orb followed him out of his makeshift hole, this is fun, he shouted to himself, I wonder what else is here. Poison darts, pitfalls, animated stone statues, fireballs, Sirzek's smile only widened as he went further into the tomb. It was amazing. This place was ancient and yet its workings and traps were still intact and functioning perfectly. Whoever built this place, built it to last, Sirzex was not a man of architecture or trap making, being a devil king took up far too much time to study such things, but he applauded the soundness and effectiveness of the tomb's defenses, lesser devils than he might have had quite the tough time with even some of the earlier defenses. Eventually, however, there was a bottom to the madness of the narrow stairs. Stepping out from the staircase, Sirzex came to a large room of some sorts, held up by a series of columns, the room was sculpted quite magnificently, with ridged designs and markings that were quite the contrast from the outside tomb's entrance. But there was also something puzzling. The room was nearly empty, no treasures, no old weapons, no golds or jewels or anything of great value. The peddler had made it seem like some great objects could be found here, indeed, the level of defense put into this place felt like a build-up towards some magnificent riches. Instead, the only notable thing about the otherwise empty room was the sarcophagus at its center. Naturally, this was a tomb, naturally, 
there would be a place where the dead owner would be buried, so why this surprised Sirzex was a wonder. Walking to the sarcophagus, Sirzex looked it over, like the room, it was brilliantly designed, flawless and preserved, the sides had strange writings on it, as well, this is what caught Sirzek's attention most of all. It was ancient, the writing was most certainly ancient, the dust and cobwebs Sirzek's had to brush away to read what it said signified this, but it was a peculiar writing, not because of what language or dialect it was. Sirzek's own mother had taught him ancient languages and writings since he was a child, but because of how simple it was. This wasn't some ancient language, it was aged in appearance, appearing time-worn and lacking in significant upkeep, but by no means was it an archaic tongue, in fact, the words were spoken modernly, had seen them used even in recent years, just not so much by devilkind, it was a language he had become familiar with, in part thanks to his knight's fluency. It was a human language called Japanese, here lies Naruto Uzumaki. A father a husband a leader may his will of fire never burn out. Sirzex read over the passage several times, what was a human-based writing doing in the underworld? The great Satan placed his hand on the sarcophagus, mesmerized, this was a mystery now, one he wanted to see through. Thus, without delay, he stood up, pressed his hands to the sarcophagus lid, and lifted. What laid inside was a marvel to behold, a long time ago, the man known as Naruto Uzumaki lived and died. All men die, of course, it was natural, but when the seventh Hokage of the village, Konohagakure, passed from the world, it left a chill in its place. His story was a long one, sparing the excessive details of a long, long tale for another time. Naruto Uzumaki was a hero among heroes, an individual who never gave in to evil or stepped away from doing what was right, a man who saw the best in people when they themselves couldn't see it, he fought wars, defeated gods and was held as a paragon for what people should aspire to. He was remembered for his achievements and the connections he made, he unified a war-torn continent and brought peace to what was once a chaotic world, he fell in love with a beautiful woman who always saw the best in him, he was the father to two wonderful children who loved him as he loved them, he made friends of enemies and redeemed the deemed irredeemable. Naruto Uzumaki was a name that would be associated as hero for centuries to come. And yet he died, all the same, he died old, he died with family around him, his wife had passed a couple years before and he wished to see her again, his country cried for his passing but he just smiled through it, telling them all he would see them again, soon, he left behind children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, all who, after his passing, would miss him dearly. Naruto Uzumaki thought that his time had come and that was the end of his journey, complete and fulfilled, he lived, so when he felt his life pass by him and as he closed his eyes one last time, he thought he was done, that a final peace would come to him. But life is often not as it would like us to believe. The moment he closed his eyes and felt the deep weariness pass through him, it hadn't felt like two seconds had passed before that feeling was ripped from him, and in that moment of elation, he opened his eyes again and saw only darkness. He blinked, his eyes roamed around him, he blinked some more. His face scrunched up in confusion, this isn't right, he thought to himself, at least, he hoped this wasn't right, when he died, he expected golden fields, gates, long past family members around him and his beloved waiting. This was just dark, did I go to that other place? He hoped not, sure, he might have not been a complete saint in his life, with his patented harem jutsu being the first thing to come to mind, but that didn't make him evil, right? Just a kid, young man trying to understand and use the majestic nature of women for combat purposes, that wasn't evil, right? The darkness didn't answer or change to a golden light for well over a minute, he guessed that meant no. Crap, he thought, Hanada's gonna kill me, if he had to bust some guys with horns and pitchforks to get back to his beloved, post-mortem, he was gonna be pissed, he was done with the whole fighting thing. Okay, well, maybe not done but he still got annoyed when his grandkids tried to sneak attack him. As old as they were around the time of his passing, he didn't have all the time in the world to kick whippersnappers like them onto their behinds. And if he actually died, Karama, he yelled, mentally, please tell me my head's not empty for the first time in decades. Karama was a beast of energy, trapped into his body when he wasn't even a day old, part of the longer story, mentioned above, the point being, the two were best friends since he was a young ninja, confidants, even, when he passed, he expected Karama to eventually reform from being an energy being in his gut to an energy being in reality. He was fine with this, Naruto knew Karama needed his freedom, but now, in the darkness, Naruto really wished he could have stayed for at least a couple hours longer. Come to think of it, how long had it been since he thought he died and woke up here? He tried to see his arms or legs in the darkness, his body felt stiff, his arms feeling like they needed a good stretch, 
How long did it take to die and go to one of the select locations permitted for dead people? He opened his mouth to yell, no words came out, just some high-pitched squeal he was embarrassed by. Great, even my voice is out of shape, how was he going to get out of this one? This thought didn't last him long, however, thankfully, he heard a scraping from his side. Someone was outside of whatever dark box he figured he was in. He tried shouting again, only managing a quiet squeal, again, he was sure the sound didn't reach out from whatever stone box he was trapped in. Naruto tried to move around in the box and make noise, how big even was this container he found himself in? As far as he stretched, neither his feet nor arms could touch the edges, he was a reasonably tall man, only his back, pressed to the bottom of his dark vessel, seemed to be feeling anything, stone, as it were, which felt unpleasantly cold at the moment to what he was just realizing now was his naked back. I am alone, in the dark, and naked, how could this get any? Then the edges of the roof of his box creaked to the side. Finally, Naruto thought, squinting his eyes as a form of light crept through the crack forming above, get me out of here demon or angel or whatever, even if he had to fight his way to heaven, he was going to give whatever was out there one heck of a battle, being aged like fine wine didn't mean you lost your edge. Musings of battle and fighting out of wherever he was trapped inside of were soon waned by the pair of eyes staring down at him from the top of the box, a human with red hair was looking down at him, perplexingly. The man blinked down at Naruto, as Naruto did the same to the man hovering over him. What, you want a picture? Naruto would have asked, grumpily, if not for the fact his voice wasn't doing more than weird squeaks, maybe he needed some water, being previously dead seemed to have left him parched in the throat. The man continued to stare downwards to the previously trapped man, as Naruto watched an odd excitement come over his eyes. Hey there, the red-haired man cooed, giving Naruto a smile that might have come off innocent and friendly but only seemed to unnerve the former Hokage. What are you doing here? He asked, throwing the box cover away and reaching his hands down towards the still lying Naruto. Who in response, started to freak, oh Kami, he's one of those guys who gets off on old men, isn't he? Not that Naruto would ever admit he was old, mind you, but that was beside the point. Trying to flail his hands out to stop the purr from grabbing hold of him, he failed magnificently as the man scooped up Naruto quite easily. Naruto struggled against his hold as the man smiled to him, Hey hey, it's alright, I got you, I got you. The mon's tone was soft and soothing, Naruto agitation and discomfort grew. Let me go. Naruto tried to yell, only for his voice to come out as some mixture between a wail and a cry, crap. What is wrong with me? This felt wrong on so many levels. The man tried to soothe the tempered Naruto by rocking him back and forth. Naruto was thoroughly weirded now. That's it. Your ass. Grass. Naruto threw his arm forward, reaching for the man's face. It couldn't have been more than a foot away, easy target. His arm went forward, attempting to close the gap with a quick jab to knock a couple of teeth out and secure a distraction for a quick escape. It was simple, practical, and didn't even come close to its intended target. Damn it! Naruto screamed inwardly, his voice still squeaking, I am gonna wipe that stupid grin off your stupid. Then he stopped, the screaming, the flailing, all of it, he stopped and looked with his two bright blue eyes at the hand he pointed towards his founder, man handler. It was small, so, so small, puny even, had seen hands like this before, back only when his children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren were born. But that couldn't be right. The man who held him reached over and placed his own hand over Naruto's, in comparison, his was giant, see? Everything's okay now, the man was smiling brightly still, Naruto's eyes never left his hand. Smooth, tiny and without calluses from years of training, no blemishes or age marks to be found, his skin was pink and smooth and almost glowed, and his fingernails, petite and sharp. Naruto raised his other hand, same deal, he tried to arc his head to look down to his feet but couldn't, he only managed to see a naked belly with the same pigmentation as his arms. Okay, hold on a sec. I need to think this through. I keep making squeaky sounds. My arms are small. My skin is pink and smooth. I am being handled with care and affection, and, and. Who's a cute little guy? You are. You are. Naruto stared at him. I am a f percent an ing baby. Grafia stood patiently outside the tomb as she waited for her lord husband to return, despite the sounds coming from inside the tomb, which included several that seemed to shake the tomb's foundation violently, Sirzek's wife had faith all was well, time passed quickly as she stood attentively until the glow of a small orb of light coming up the stairway from the tomb became visible, followed shortly by Sirzek's. 
and he didn't come empty-handed, quirking a silvery eyebrow on her usually stoic and passive features, Graphia walked calmly to her husband, who had his cloak wrapped closely around something in his arms, looking past the cloth, she saw two large, bright blue eyes turn and stare at her. She stared at the baby in Sirzek's arms for a long, quiet moment, she stared at it, then up to her beloved. His smile was sheepish, can we keep him? Roughly 16 to 17 human years into the future. It's 7 a.m. Are you ready to accept Phoenix Wright as your lord and savior? A hand reached out from underneath a thicket of bedcovers to smash down on an annoying alarm clock at the side. A loud grunt could be heard through the large apartment as a bushel of bright blonde hair made its way from under the covers of the bed. Exhausted and looking irritable, the blonde haired owner of the hand stood up from his bed in a slouch, scratching his bed hair loose. The blonde made his way out of his bedroom and into the kitchen, stretching out tight muscles as he did so. The blonde attempted to blink out remaining levels of exhaustion as he pulled out a carton of orange juice and drank it straight from the lid, though taught better than to do so, he had a busy night prior, he earned a little pass from common practices of standard living. Once the carton was empty, he pulled his mouth away and offered a sigh of relief, nothing beat orange juice. Tossing the empty carton into a waiting trash bin, the blonde casually walked to the window of his apartment, gazing out over the view of several houses, stores and the single high school building off in the distance. The owner of the apartment smiled out to the view. So, he said to himself, I wonder if Reynare is going to kill Issei today? He continued to stare out at his view for a while, before shrugging and turning back to his kitchen, he felt in the mood for waffles. The underworld, forested area, just outside of Gremory territory. Perhaps a testament to the cool edge that was the Lady Graphia, her immediate reaction to the newborn staring at her, comfortably wrapped in her lord husband's robes, was to raise a single, silvery eyebrow in mild surprise. She had expected her husband to go into the tomb seeking riches or worthwhile items to bring back to the surface, instead, he walked out with an infant in hand, even for a devil such as Sears X Lucifer, this was unusual. Then he asked if they could keep it. Graphia was used to her husband's simplistic nature, the great Satan Lord, who held the proud name of Lucifer, was a bizarre man to many, with his coupled passion and capability as a leader of devilkind being balanced by his easygoing nature, indeed, the four great Satans were an eccentric bunch in the typically well-mannered and collective devil society. Graphia stared down at the child presented to her, the child, a boy, she guessed, based on his features, stared silently back to her, a small bushel of almost yellowish blonde hair, a slight pink tint to his otherwise pale skin, tiny lips and nose, these features were nothing uncommon or exceptionally eye-catching, in those regards, the child was like any other Graphia had seen in her life. But that wasn't what kept the Lucifuge woman's attention. His cheeks were scarred, three lines pointed outwards from where they pointed towards the boy's lips, birthmarks, she might have guessed, but the marks were too perfect, too similar and perfectly alike, to be a case of simple skin irregularities, reaching out with a single, smooth finger. Graphia confirmed her suspicions when she felt the cheek marks offer some depth into the skin, they were peculiar but not the most dramatic aspect to the child's features. Graphia stared into the boy's eyes, they stared back at her. They followed her finger and looked over her face as the two tried to make out one another, the eyes weren't those of a child, they didn't hold that simplicity or straightforwardness newborn eyes usually held, instead, the crystal blue eyes of the child seemed to, or attempted to, at least, understand its surroundings, this babe in her husband's hands was watching everything with a stern expression that made the boy seem like he was almost glaring. Babies did not glare, they cried, whined, smiled, giggled, laughed, stirred in their sleep and occasionally held a blissful expression of uncaring to its surroundings, a newborn could not glare because a glare required emotions and negative feelings that it couldn't possibly have developed. Yet here one was, watching Graphia with wary, looking like it would bite if she came too close. Graphia raised her head to look to her husband, either he chose to ignore the abnormalities of finding this very stoic child inside of the decrepit tomb that seemingly hadn't been discovered for millennia as mere coincidence or he chose to ignore it, based on his grinning expression, it was quite possible that either of the possibilities might have been the truth. Sears ex Lucifer was her husband, she loved him, fool and all. Reaching out with her arms, she wrapped her hands around the bundle of clothing, taking the small babe, the newborn really was a tiny, weightless thing to the devil woman, having him in her arms, she supposed this was where most women would feel some motherly instinct towards the child put into their care, instead, she watched as the newborn's eyes narrowed somewhat further. This was a bizarre child, indeed, where did you find this little one, my lord? She asked formally, wondering quietly if rocking the boy might assuage its tempered face, she doubted it. 
Sears X watched the two quietly before answering, I found him in the tomb. I assumed as much, Greyfi is calm, collective voice hadn't risen or sounded harsher than before, though her expression did show slight annoyance, I meant specifically. Sears X looked pleased at getting even a small rise from his usually stoic wife, in the sarcophagus, he specified further, watching as Greyfia let one of her sharp, silver eyebrows rise towards her brow. Sarcophagus. She wondered if she heard him right, Sears X nodded in reply, going into detail on his exciting adventure into the bottom of the tomb, the untouched grave, the Japanese writing, the traps and defenses. Grafia listened attentively to it all, holding back her questions until the end. What was a newborn doing in such a place? This was mostly amusing to herself, but her husband answered her, sort of, a good question. And one I intend to find out, he said, turning away from the stone structure and making a wave of his hand out towards the grassy area, out of seemingly nowhere, a large circle glowing with vibrant crimson and decorated with various letterings and symbols, appeared before the two devils, the infant, who was turned around in Grafia's arms towards the strange runic symbols that appeared out of nothingness, widened its eyes. But for now, I suggest we save the questions for another time, it is quite late, he smiled, raising a hand and brushing it through the small tuft of blonde hair the babe had, and I think little Naruto wants to take a nappy. The high-pitched, Baby words coming from the devil ruler almost seemed to make the infant slightly irritated. Sears X figured he was just grouchy, or tired, or hungry. What did babies eat, anyway? Grafia, however, turned to her husband curiously, Naruto? Oh. Yeah. The name on the tomb was for someone named for an Uzumaki Naruto, Sears X informed, hoping his pronunciation was correct as the infant turned its attention away from the glowing crimson symbols on the ground and back towards his founder. I figured it was a good name for him. It was a simple enough explanation to his reasoning. Why? Don't like it. I did not oppose, Grafia stated, only being curious as to where such an unorthodox name had originated, turning her head down to the newborn. The silver haired woman said the name softly, testing it only for her own use. Naruto, it was simply a means to test her tongue to such a unique word, but found herself surprised to see the infant then turn to meet her gaze. It was a peculiar moment. The child did not seem as annoyed as it had before, though. How annoyed a small child could even seem to be was something of a question for later times. Grafia was more curious. Did it approve the name, perhaps? The idea was silly for a little one to even understand what was occurring but this blonde child was silly in its own way. So, turning her head back to her bright, cheerful husband, Grafia merely finished her testing with a simple, smooth statement of her thoughts, I do not object to the naming. Good. Then does that mean we can keep him? This managed to cause Grafia's brow to furrow, along with the babes, my lord, he is not a familiar or pet to be found or purchased, he is a child, you do not simply ask to keep such a thing. Then what do we do with it? Didn't the rule of finders keepers work here? We will consider that in the morrow, for now, let us see to his needs and ready for the day after. Sears X shrugged, grinning as he stepped into the crimson circle beside his wife, all right, but if we are keeping him, I expect to give him a little brother. This was meant in jest, Grafia wasn't aware, that can be arranged, she glanced down to the babe in her arms as the child's eyes widened around the circle, very peculiar, this child, very peculiar. Sears X eyes quickly lost their sense of playfulness at his wife's last words before the circular ring of energy glowed intensely, blanketing the nearby trees and structure in bright light, then, just as quickly as it came, the light dimmed and was gone, leaving the area unmarked and untampered by devilkind. The two devils and the newborn were nowhere to be seen. Present day, human world, country of Japan Kuo Academy, a former all-girls private school comprised of several architecturally impressive buildings. Having turned into a co-ed facility in recent years, the impressive standards of the school's facilities, faculties and students only increased with additional male gender ratio. The school was jewel amongst the people who lived in the vicinity and was the location where many bright futures would certainly begin, comprised of several academic levels of learning. A primary, high school and college division, the academy was often considered an extravagantly well-crafted university for all ages, the students wore impressively designed uniforms, kept an equally strong united background of kinship through sports, festivals and other school-funded activities, and were all expected to hold a level of excellence that befit Kuo Academy's reputation. On this particular day, the sun shone quite brightly over the arriving students for early morning classes, of note, in a sharp contrast from normal learning facilities, most of the students seemed eager to begin their classes for the day, each dressed to in professional uniform and walked with pride. Standing at the gates leading into the academy, a young woman watched her fellow students carefully. 
The young woman was in her late teens, holding a slim figure along with her average build and height, she wore the standard Kuo Academy uniform, similar to her peers, signifying her status as a student, the girl's complexion was smooth and flawless without so much as blemish. Her hair was short and kept from her face using a single, yellow hairclip around her left ear. Her deep violet eyes were covered by bespectacled glasses that gave her the appearance of someone who enjoyed their studies, perhaps even more so than the already enthusiastic student body of Kuo. The young woman's name was Suna Shitori, student council president of Kuo Academy. Or, at least, that's how the majority of the students referred to her as, her true nature was something far more impressive. At the moment, Suna was frowning by the entrance gates, the reason was obvious to anyone who knew her. This was not her station, this was not her place in the academy, Suna was performing disciplinary work on behalf of the student disciplinary squad, as a favor, as rumors of invaded female privacy around the locker rooms and personal facilities had been regulating for some time. Suna Shitori was a proud woman, she believed the student council had their selected tasks to uphold on a daily basis, as did the rest of the disciplinary squad, the student council organized funds and events to promote the happiness of the student body, the disciplinary squad kept the order of the academy preserved, both held respectable positions, but were meant to work separately as to not endanger either organization of one another's tasks. She denied them, at first, explaining as much, then the captain of the squad fell to his knees, bowed to Suna in front of her entire council, and begged for just one day's worth of assistance so that they could catch the perpetrators. Thus Suna relented, as she now found herself, alone, amongst the arriving students, watching carefully for anything, well, undisciplined. By all accounts, this activity was quite uninteresting, and until she was permitted to close the gates to any late arrivals, she assumed she would remain in such a way. Then a banana popped in front of her line of view. Morning, Suna Chan. A loud, cheerful voice rang out beside her, startling the student council president out of her relaxed state of mind, as she turned to the owner addressing her. It was a boy who addressed her, a man, if she were to be more accurate, tall with fair skin and dressed in the usual student body required outfit, though, he neglected to button his up at the moment, letting it hang loosely open, a tuft of long, almost spiky blonde hair seemed to catch the eye first from this new addition to the schoolyard, which seemed to work in tandem with the deep blue of his eyes. People were staring at them, one did not simply walk to the student council president, a certain level of address and proper decorum was required, Bo, show respect to order of authority, something. The man just smiled his pure white teeth down to Suna without so much as a care as to his surroundings or the people around him. The boy's name was Naruto Uzumaki, a close friend, if Suna were being honest, and had been so for many years now. And in his outstretched hand, he shook the banana, breakfast? Suna stared at the offered fruit, silently, she mused on how indirect and informal this action was, not to mention how being offered a banana from a boy in the early morning might have come off as a slight innuendo. But this did not bother her, his disregard for social grace or decorum while in a presence of authority, such as her own, was refreshing. She stared at his grinning face for a moment, no coffee? She asked, raising an eyebrow. In return, the blonde's eyebrow twitched, coffee. Suna nodded, it is usually customary to purchase a beverage of some sort when offering a young lady an early morning meal, coffee is easy to carry and prevalent in quantity, thus, coffee would be appropriate. He stared at her, his grin falling, you're kidding, right? Not at all, coffee would be most useful at this time, even tea would be an appreciative second, it would help alleviate my boredom. The blonde's face offered a flat expression, and I can't help with that. Not as much as coffee would, no, she turned away from watching her peers to stare at her tall friend intensely, coffee would help. The two stared at one another, crystal blue to royal violet, a mock battle of wills over the other, though the boy wouldn't admit it, those violet eyes were deadly, as expected from someone who held the position she held. And he didn't just mean that of the student council president. The boy kept a strong front for as long as he was able but soon let out a defeated sigh, right, right, he groaned, lifting up the bag he held in his opposite hand, which from where Suna stood was well hidden from her view, and pulled out a small cup, it was steaming, black, no sugar or cream. Suna stared at him coolly, she guessed correctly, the blonde still enjoyed playing his little games with her, Naruto Uzumaki never grew up in the years she knew him, nor did she desire that he would, it was a trait of his that she enjoyed, soothing, even, in his nonchalant attitude. And if it helped alleviate the dullness of the early morning, all the better, thank you for the meal, she replied, reaching out to take the offered beverage and fruit with her hands, the blonde nodding in a dejected manner, she didn't even question how the blonde was aware that she would even be around so early in the morning, 
The Uzumaki boy simply did things on the spur of the moment and worked with them as they were. Suna accepted this, for sanity's sake. Now, what might you be doing here so early? Aren't you usually running to meet the second bell? His reputation of near perfect, near tardiness preceded him. I was gonna bring Gasper some snacks. He smiled, waving the small bag in hand, as he stood beside the black haired president to watch the arriving students. Really? Suna asked surprised, that's generous of you, I figured it was Rias or Kaneko san's task to do so today. Yeah, yeah, but I was up and hungry and figured to do something nice, and if I got to school early, he shrugged, offering his half lie to the girl, there was more to his reason being here, but she didn't need to be made aware of it just yet, it was an assignment he was taking on personally as a favor to an associate, he would call him. In fact, part of his assignment was walking through the gates without a care or worry to be found. Well, I am sure I speak for the rest of the students and faculty when I say your aptitude for actually coming early for a school day is nothing short of. Suna paused in her humorous poking when she noticed Naruto's attention elsewhere, she blinked, turning to follow his gaze towards a group of young female students. Of course, one in particular stood out from the rest. Long, luscious black hair that flowed down to the lower back of her uniform, a curvy figure that women would die for, legs that seemed to go on for miles. The girl at the center of the passing group of friends was a knockout by every definition of the male mind. Suna didn't recognize the girl, she must have been a new transfer student, and obviously, she had Naruto's attention outright. Funny, Soma thought, jabbing an annoyed finger into Naruto's side, I never pictured Naruto would be into such things, simplicity was a word that described Naruto well, despite his upbringing and overall ability, he wasn't usually one to leer at a passing female that caught his eyes, Rias would have a field day with this. Naruto grunted, rubbing his poked side, what, what, what did I do? Suna HMPHED, sipping her coffee, don't you have snacks to deliver? Naruto groaned, yeah yeah, I am on it, didn't bringing breakfast to pretty young women mean something anymore, or was it just taken for granted? Later, Suna Chan. HMPH, still peeved, Suna turned back to her watch as Naruto made his way towards the old school building at the edge of Kuo Academy grounds. Inside the old school building, Kuo Academy women. Arg. Even knowing them for a hundred years wouldn't give a guy a clear idea of how they work. Naruto thought irritably to himself as he rubbed the sore point where the aggravated Shitori woman had poked him unmercifully, making his way through an old, dimly lit hallway of the old school building at the far end of the academy with a somewhat vexed expression. What got on her nerves anyway? Had asked himself several times now, I was listening to her, I brought her breakfast. I was being a nice person. His irritable thoughts were starting to make themselves more visible on the youth's face, and to make matters worse, my little pigeon problem decided to fly a little too close to the sun. Arg! Seriously, he yelled, what do girls have going through their heads? Either they were mad, turning mad, being mad, or doing mad things. Even his wife suffered from this from time to time, and she was as perfect as perfect got. Groaning, Naruto figured it was just one of those things a man would never understand. The mind of a woman. Maybe it was for the best, what dangers lied in there was perhaps best left undisturbed. With that depressing thought in mind, Naruto walked to the very end of the narrow hallway had been traversing for the last minute, coming up to the hallway's end and stood before a pair of wooden doors, in appearance, these pair of wooden doors looked much the same as any other in the old building. Somewhat worn, oak made and with an iron handle to open with, the only striking feature that differentiated the pair from any other doorway was the noticeable barriers that separated any and all occupants between the hallway and the room beyond, from wall to wall, yellow warning tape stood between Naruto and the doorway, in addition to a sturdy steel chain that wrapped itself around the door handles. By and large, the tape and chain definitely gave the appearance that the room was off limits to any and all trespassers, perhaps warning of some construction work being handled or of a structural weakness within, either way. The message was clear to anyone on what these barriers were insinuating, stay away. And so naturally, navigating a free hand around the tape, Naruto gave one of the doors a soft, but still quite audible, knock, yo, Gasper, you awake. Naruto ni chan. A muffled yell came from the other side of the door, as Naruto made out faint sounds of shuffling from the other end. I got snacks, want some? He yelled back, holding up his bag of goodies despite knowing they couldn't be seen. Yes yes. Absolutely, Ni Chan. Come in come in. With that, Naruto moved around the warning tape, feeling a familiar unseen force attempt to press him back harshly to no avail, managing to pick the chains and locks tied around the handles before carefully opening the door. 
Despite the warning signs that made the room out to be practically a hazard zone, the room was actually quite nicely made, once Naruto turned on the lights. The room was a large, squared area, easily the size of a classroom from the main building. The walls were lined with pink and white striped wallpaper, which sharply contrasted with the age of the building's structure. There were pieces of furniture, such as dressers and desks, pressed to the corners and sides, making the room come off as almost a storage area toppled with a bedroom. Even one of the lone boxes off to the sides had a small brown rabbit toy sitting comfortably on top. The peculiarity of why this room had to have such fortifications to prevent anyone from entering would have been stopped then and there if that was the only thing to see. Instead, the true eye catcher lied at the center of the room's structure, a large black coffin, decorated with a large rosario cross that stretched out from the bottom to top of its lid, sat comfortably within view of the doorway, a long white shroud hung above it, giving off a sense of mysticism and wonder to the clearly antique piece. Then one saw it shifting and shaking with a small patter of grunts in between. The rustling quickly gave way as the coffin's top was pushed upwards and to the side, showing off what appeared to be a young girl, lying comfortably on top of violet silk that covered the edges of the coffin, it was a startling sight to anyone unfamiliar with the old school building. The apparent girl smiled brightly up to Naruto's entering form. She couldn't have been much older than fifteen, with short, almost platinum blonde hair drawing down to the sides of her neck. Pale skin glistened in the dimly lit room along with twinkling pink eyes that held no small amount of intrigue to them. Noticeably, pointing out from the sides of the obvious bed hair, two sharply pointed ears could be made out by the new arrival to the room. The coffin sleeper wore the designed uniform befitting a student of Kuo Academy, along with very long stockings that reached almost to the academy skirt. This ensemble and appearance of a now excitable looking individual with a cute expression might have come off as adorable to Naruto, except for the small issue to the girl's person. The issue being, aside from the very feminine air around this person, the girl, Gaspar Vladdy, was, in fact, very much male. When first finding out this, Naruto felt very perturbed, had admit as much, while Gaspar had been the first male to join his friends club and gave him someone to talk to on a similar, at least physically, basis of age and sex, the boy's unusual fixation with girlish clothing made Naruto call him, as his former sensei would aptly put it, a trap. Ni Chan. The boy girl would ever yelled excitedly, moving from his coffin as Naruto closed the door behind him. Smiling to himself, Naruto pulled three chocolate bars from his small bag and stared at the boy. Time for the weekly routine. Hey, Gasper. Gasper paused, staring at him. He should have realized what came next. Think fast. With a twist of his wrist, the three brown bars of sweet chocolate were tossed at the young boy, leaving him to gasp in shock at the incoming projectiles drawing his back away quickly as the items closed in towards his unprotected face. Then the platinum-haired boy's eyes glowed, oh, come on Gasper. Nii I chans mean to me. I said I was sorry. Why do you always do this to me e e e e e? Because you're my friend, and friends help one another. You tried to poke my eyes out with candy. I failed, didn't I? Wa a. W a a a a a h h h h. Naruto put his hand to his face and groaned hoping to rub the irritation off his features as he sat beside the closed coffin Gasper had previously crawled out of, it was no use, this almost always happened, one step forward, two steps back. Turning to where Gasper previously stood, Naruto couldn't help but be amazed at the three candy bars floating in midair, all forward movement, all pressure of gravity, everything within that small energy field Naruto could barely make out was stopped by the boy now crying in his coffin, time and space stalled for an only guessable amount of time. That was what was so special about the boy at Naruto's side. Gaspar Vladdy was a time stopper, or, more specifically, a being that possessed the ability to stop time on anything he perceived, through concentration and focus. Gaspar had a unique, inheritable ability to humans called a sacred gear, with this specific one allowing him to distort the very essence of the universe around a specific point or place. Named the Forbidden Belor View, Gaspar's sacred gear was powerful and difficult to control. Naruto remembered the first time he met him. He wrapped the boy in a chokehold of friendship, or something like it, and the next thing he knew, three hours had passed, he found Gasper crying in a corner of the room, hiding in a box, the poor boy blamed himself, Naruto just found it awesome and, despite his mental age, asked if he could do it again excitedly. But the thing that really struck Naruto was Gasper's origin. Specifically, Gasper was a hybrid being, half human and half vampire. Now, Naruto might have squealed on how cool his new best buddy was, but had never admit it. Sadly, however, the forbidden Belor view was difficult for Gasper to control, 
Even with years of practice offered by Naruto in the most unorthodox of ways imaginable, Gaspar still feared his powers, and as they grew with him, so did his fear until Naruto and his father decided to enclose the boy into a part of the old school building for the sake of his mentality. In a sense, Gaspar was a shut in. Now, Naruto made routine trips, either after class or at times as late as midnight, to check on the boy, power and nerves aside, he was a good person, and Naruto could attest to understanding what loneliness felt like. Vladdy, come on. I got class. Naruto begged, knocking on the crying coffin. Look, I am sorry. Okay. If you want, I can leave the bag here, okay. He heard the crying die down to a sniffle. Progress in some form, usually had cry for several minutes longer or until Naruto left. Sniff sniff. Why you promise to leave the candy here? When don't I leave them for you? Seriously, candy. What was he gonna do with it? Give it to Kaneko chan she got enough candy as it was. Hey are you sure you'll leave it? Yes, really sure. Yes. Really, really sure. Naruto stared at the coffin with a flat expression, by Gasper, he made for the door. W wait. Ni ch by ye Gasper. Ni ch a a a a a a a a n n n n n. Gasper was always a work in progress, his leaving abruptly wasn't anything new, if Naruto stayed any longer had run the risk of being late and the last thing he needed was a report sent to his mother over his absence from lessons she insisted he partake. Or worse, if a report was sent to Lady Venelana, unconsciously, Naruto shuddered from a slight chill at the thought of his grandmother as he walked down the steps of the old school building and his clubhouse, taking a moment to look it over. Naruto admitted the design wasn't so bad, it reminded him a little of his own office when had been the leader of his village. The old school building was aptly named, to be certain before the renovation of its foundation by the Academy's Occult Research Club. Restructured and redone to hold out impressively even amongst the newer buildings of the Academy, the building was now used primarily for the club's purposes, as granted by the Student Council, the woodwork was refurbished, the structure fortified, the furniture and decorations placed appropriately for design and compatibility. The work that the building had seen was akin to what famous renovators and architects worked on for company buildings or even major CEO offices. The building had seen far worse days before his club president took charge of it three years prior and made it something of a castle for herself. Naruto glanced up to the corner window of the building, it was open, letting a small breeze fly in, silently. Naruto wondered if his friend was waiting there for class to start, wouldn't have surprised him. He remembered how she liked to enjoy a game of chess, either with herself or her clubmates, before the start of class. Naruto shrugged, if his president was feeling confident she'd reach her classroom before the bell rang then who was he to question? Somebody help me eee. -e -e. Naruto blinked, knocked from his musings by the sudden shout, shriek coming his way. Turning his head, Naruto watched with growing perplexity as a quickly recognized young man from his class sprinted past him, brown hair, fair skin, average height, Issei Hyoto, the famous pervert of the academy, and by pervert, Naruto meant pervert, as in, this guy made every pervert who ever existed look like a young boy curious about female anatomy. Even Naruto, who once created techniques to use one's sexuality against them, marveled at the lust for breasts the boy exerted. Speaking of which, said boy's lust seemed to have put him into a rather bothersome situation, at the moment, he was running from the several females with looks to kill. Specifically, the looks were coming from Kuo Academy's female kendo club team. Pervert. Drop dead, jackass. You're the reason I can't trust men. I will make sure you never reproduce. Ouch, that one even hurt Naruto. Stepping to the side, Naruto watched Issei run past, gasping for air as he tried to outrun the physically superior females, he was certainly not a boy of physique and reminded Naruto in a roundabout way to the green beasts of Konoha, their fires of youth really could come in handy for the young man running for the sake of his crotch. Watching him and his desperate state of jog, Naruto chuckled silently, he didn't wish to see the boy hurt, but enjoying a good humorous situation wasn't a crime, right? It wasn't like he tripped the boy or anything as he ran past, Issei was a pervert to be absolutely certain but death of his unborn children might have been a bit extreme, especially when rumors stated the captain of the offended kendo club was able to cut through solid iron with just her kendo stick. Naruto mulled that rumor over in his head, his task was to protect the boy from stray pigeons and poor mental states, angry females weren't in his required assignment checklist. Thus, with a last glance towards the open second story window, he picked up his step and made to move towards class. He had a reputation of only nearly missing class, after all. Inside her own little room on the second floor of her castle, 
A rather endowed young woman looked out from her window to see a familiar set of spiky blonde hair move towards the main academy building, smiling. She wrapped a finger through her vibrant crimson hair and curled it gently as she watched the boy before he disappeared from her view behind some trees. A shame, she considered blowing away the trees with the flick of her wrist for the briefest of moments, but that would cause a scandal amongst the students, she couldn't have that, instead, she sighed in regret before turning and walking towards the door out of the room, her vice president should have finished with her own preparations for class by now and neither wanted to be late. Issei arrived shortly after Naruto, groaning and panting with minor scratches but seemed otherwise fine, he screamed and yelled at his friends, who turned out to have been the reason behind his need for a jog and openly complained about having bluer balls then was healthy all the way to the start of homeroom. But, by the end of the day, nothing special occurred beyond the basic lessons expected from a high school. No surprise guests, no pigeons popping up, no problems. It was a standard, boring day in Naruto's book, post-class chaos, however, quickly ensued. Naruto chewed into an apple as he watched from the branches of an old oak tree a sulking Issei, after the school day had ended, the boy began to take the usual route towards home before deciding to stop on an overpass bridge and sulk about rotten luck or something, Naruto turned down his hearing capabilities around the time when the boy began to turn vocal about the unfairness of not having a girlfriend and how jerking off was all he had to look forward to in his poor, high school life. Naruto didn't really know how to relate to that, in his youth, wow that felt weird to say in a teenage body, had fought in wars that changed the very landscapes of continents. Had nearly died on multiple occasions that had lost count, his constant training and focus made falling in love and anything to do with women one of the last things on his mind, plus, when you have someone in your head who constantly knew what you were up to, doing anything freaky ended with a loud roar of constant laughter that no amount of yelling could stop. And on that pleasant note, Naruto perked his ears over the sound of passing cars when he noticed a certain female walk onto the bridge next to the moping teenager. This is where things got interesting. Excuse me. The young girl spoke up, catching the boy's attention. You're Issei Hyodo, right? Issei stared at her, dumbfounded. The girl started to look conscientious of herself, or am I mistaken, perhaps? Naruto took another bite of his apple as Issei answered in the positive. The girl's blush was practically glowing. Um, hi. I, uh, I, um. The girl shifted on her feet, looking uncomfortable. Issei moved from his slouch position on the railing of the bridge to address the cute girl beside him, is there, uh, something I can help you with? The girl managed a nod, sort of, she answered softly, I, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. This time the words were practically yelled, hoping to be heard over the oncoming traffic below. Naruto finished his apple and tossed it over his shoulder, pulling another from his coat pocket. Hey are you seeing anyone right now? She continued, red-faced and quiet once more barely being heard by either of the two boys listening. She seemed to recognize her own inaudibility, turning somewhat redder in the face than before and now actively avoiding Issei's gaze. Issei, innocent to what was occurring, just looked confused, right now. He asked, making sure he heard her right, she nodded, uh, no, I am not. The girl's mood brightened, that's wonderful, she yelled, before looking abashed at her sudden excitement, that's wonderful because, uh, in that case, since you're single, would you consider going out with me? Naruto could see from his tree that Issei was hooked. I've been watching you for a while, and I've seen you pass by this place and I thought you seemed, I don't know, gentle, she smiled slightly, and very handsome and I, well, see, I, I think I'd, I'd, her face was full of blush and her stutter was adorable, she worked up the courage for one final yell of her confession. I'd like you to be my boyfriend. Naruto actually laughed from his tree spot, Convinced the cars below the bridge would cover the noise, from his point of view, Issei looked like he just won the lottery three times in a row. Issei managed a nod with a small aha uh -huh much to the girl's great delight, she looked ecstatic as she made plans with the mostly dumbfounded boy on when she could pick him up to walk to school together, Issei gave the information, nodded at the appropriate times, then waved as the girl left her new boyfriend to himself. Issei stood completely still on that bridge for well over 15 minutes, just staring at where the girl ran off to before letting out a fierce cheer of joy and making a run for home, the sheer shine of his excitement would have otherwise put a smile on his blonde watcher's face had the situation not taken a turn for the worse. Guess I've gotta watch him in the mornings, too, Naruto muttered, sighing as he dropped from the tree, at least he wouldn't have to follow him home today because now he started to get an idea of what was the deal with this new pigeon. She wanted the Emmy, she wanted the Golden Globe, she wanted to play. And that was fine, Naruto liked playing games too. 
The next few days were perhaps the best days of Issei's short life, by Naruto's opinion, his protective observation, as had begun to call it, out of annoyance to the word stalking by his employer, was going well. The girl, who, as Naruto found out, decided to go by the name Yuma Amano, became the favorite topic of Issei's life, she was the doting girlfriend, the heartthrob, the best a man could ask for in a lady friend, Issei introduced her to anyone he knew, almost as if he tried to prove she existed to the people he met as much as to himself. He obviously cared for her, which was a weird contrast from how Naruto expected the boy to act around the girl. Apparently, Issei Hyodo was only about 95% of a horndog, rather than the believed 100%, good for him. After little over a week of staking out the pair, Naruto finally received the info he needed to hear. Go out? You mean, like out out? As in, out with me? Issei asked, looking at his girlfriend, he just loved saying that, with wide eyes, as she smiled back excitedly. Uh huh. I was thinking about this Sunday and if you'd like to go to the mall or something, her voice was so sweet and innocent, she scratched her chin unsurely, that is, if you want. Of course I wanna, no doubt, Issei interrupted, suddenly pumped, this Sunday is perfect for me. The girl smiled, pleased, excellent, she told him a time, a place and gave him a quick goodbye before running off on her own, looking embarrassed, Issei waved goodbye before going into hysterics at the prospect of possibly seeing real 3D lady parts. Naruto shrugged himself off another tree and aimed back towards his apartment complex. At least he knew what he'd be doing this Sunday, mall area. Issei had to have been the luckiest guy on the planet. Yuma was a girl a guy dreamed of having in his life, her smile, her enjoyment to his company, even her choice in clothing. How did someone like her exist? One minute, had been sulking about the world being against him in the next? God sends him an angel. His open perverseness made him believe had been cursed with poor fortune for the rest of his days. But now, with Yuma Chan at his side, he just felt more accepted and brighter and cheerful. And they were dating. How awesome was that? Their first date together made him laugh and lose all inhibitions to what he might do to ruin that day for her. Their first date was, by extension, Issei's first date, and if this was how it was gonna be like with her every day he knew her, he might just quick his pornos and magazines and live straight off of Yuma's smile. Okay. That might have been a stretch, but still. How had he, the leader of the perverted trio, managed to earn such a goddess? They did everything he thought a couple was supposed to do on a fun date, they checked out a clothing store, messed around with various fabrics for the laughs and ate ice cream by the cup load, the entire date felt like one of those cliché date scenes you saw in those chick flicks his mom liked to rent out and cry to along with his dad, but, maybe they had some realism to them. Was this how happy people were together? And best of all, he even got to see some of her over boob, it was awesome. And now, as the sun was going down, Issei felt confident enough to hold her hand as they walked through the park, he was making a move, and working. She held on tightly to his hand in return, smiling gently to the ground with red in her cheeks, Issei noticed this and felt his heart flutter. Perhaps this was love? It had to be, he wasn't thinking of owning a harem anymore, just having her seemed enough. In fact, just having her was starting to sound really good right then. Issei-kun? Yuma said quietly, getting Issei's undivided attention as they stopped beside a fountain in the park, the sun was lowering down, glistening off the fountain's flowing waters, with the trees offering them a cool breeze that flowed through Yuma's hair, giving it an ethereal wave of serenity, it really hit the romantic mark. Yi yeah, yeah, Yuma-chan. Issei asked, smiling as he tried to calm down his nerves, only wondering what this amazing girl was about to say. Can I ask you to do something for me? In honor of our first date together? The way she said first made Issei excited that there might actually be more for him in the future. Sure. You can ask me for anything, he said, looking at her smile and wondering if this is where he'd get his first kiss from, his heart was starting to pump almost painfully in his chest in anticipation. Good, she said, sighing before taking a deep breath and looking him straight in the eye, Will. Issei's eyes must have been wide as he was prepared to practically do anything to keep this girl smiling for the rest of his life. Will you, die for me? Naturally, Issei blinked at that one. Uh, could you repeat that, please? He asked, laughing off what he must have misheard, I must have something in my ear. Yuma's smile widened, I asked if you would die for me? That time, he heard her, eh? Yuma laughed silently, as she brought her hands out to her sides, her features turning dark as she looked at the perplexed young man in front of her. Yuma's appearance began to change, her clothes started to take on a darker tint, twisting and changing into material that seemed akin to leather as it grasped tightly to her sides, 
what was once a rather innocent and cute shirt and skirt had turned into a rather scandalous dress that complemented her breasts and curves quite proudly. The world around Issei began to twist and deform alongside Yuma's appearance, with an eerie purple and black barrier surrounding the pair and most of the park with them, aside from the two, however, no one else seemed to be around to be caught in this twisted state of reality. Issei's eyes bugged as Yuma began to cackle at her new state when a pair of long, coal-black bird wings sprouted from her shoulder blades, curling around her comfortingly, then she pressed off the ground, keeping the wings outstretched as she hovered several feet off the ground, in front of the shocked, and slightly turned on, young man, he seemed to only be managing to make out the bare minimum of what was going on, with boobs taking up a lot of ram speed in that perverted mind of his. The look Yuma gave her boyfriend was sinister, I will admit. Isei-kun, today wasn't all that bad, I did have some fun. It was a nice break from the usual hassle I had to go through, she lifted her arm up to her face, looking at a pink scrunchy Issei bought for her back at the clothes store, it was very sweet, she mused, before turning to point her hand to the boy, but like all things, this sweet memory must come to an end, Yuma's hand started to turn a violent crimson, as the light twisted in air to form something that looked akin to a glowing, jagged spear. Issei stared at it all from his fallen state on the ground, the wings, the spear, the barrier, it was too much, wait, Yuma, please. In return, Yuma only smiled, now, it's time to de -aw. Splash. The past minute seemed to be getting more and more unusual for the hormonal teen on the ground. A minute ago, his girlfriend asked him to die for her. Thirty seconds ago, she went full leather on him, could have been worse. Fifteen seconds ago, she made a spear out of red light. Ten seconds ago, she tried to stab him with said spear. Presently, he was now looking at the backside of a familiar blonde-haired boy, who only seconds ago grabbed a hold of one of Yuma's wings, twisted it violently in a circle, and threw her into the fountain. The blonde-haired guy, Naruto, Issei thought he remembered it right, was staring intently at the water before glancing back quickly to Issei's prone, downed form, the look in his eyes almost made Issei doubt he had the right guy, and Naruto senpai? Naruto lifted up two fingers, yo, the water erupted from the fountain in front of them, turning their attention back to the winged woman, who now hovered several feet off the ground, soaking and panting at having just been man-handled into the park decoration. Though Issei couldn't see it, Naruto's expression hardened, stay there, he ordered, getting Issei's brief attention, ill handle this, Issei couldn't even nod in acknowledgement before his blonde peer took a couple steps forward, staring at his floating, leather-clad girlfriend. Yuma snarled as water constantly fell from her wings and body, turning her attention to the newest addition to Park's confined space. She met the blonde stare, who the hell are you? A big damn hero, then he leapt at her. Naruto Uzumaki was known as a paragon of strength, dexterity, ability and knowledge in his time as the Hokage, the leader, of his village. He was revered for his charismatic nature and influence over the lives of millions. His very presence demanded absolute attention and respect. Even in his waning years in active service, the air around him was vibrant and full of energy, regardless if he was having a friendly chat with a foreign delegate or taking a stroll through the forests to check on the generations that followed, his stature during times of conflict struck fear into the eyes of his foes as he stood at the precipice of armies, his smile warmed the heart, his laugh made grown men stronger, and his belief in the betterment of men made the world a brighter place. So you can imagine the sharp contrast this new, miniature baby form felt in comparison. Over the span of several days under the care of the silver-haired maid woman and various other maid-dressed members of the large estate the couple had teleported to, Naruto slowly came to understanding that neither his body nor consciousness were dead, that this was not some form of dream or his own personal hell, that he had, for lack of better understanding to the situation, been reborn into this newborn's body. This created an interesting first few days, Naruto was fully aware of everything that was going around him, as he recalled, children were often born blind or lacking a large level of vision outside of a certain distance, they were largely unsure of the world around them for quite some time, he did not have that issue. From the corner of his new crib to the violet sky outside of his bedroom, Naruto was seeing everything he could see in his previous life, better, even, his eyes had started to dull as he aged but these new pair of eyes were clear and precise as they could have been, a positive to an otherwise unpleasant experience. Naruto could hear, understand, feel and taste everything around his tiny body. He could hear the coos and baby words his caretakers used to try and get him to smile or laugh, in which he did, if only for how unbelievably weird the whole act was. He understood the silver-haired woman's questions to her staff on how he was acting or behaving, obviously curious to Naruto's most assuredly unusual baby attitude, 
he could touch the soft fabric of his crib and felt the comfortable hold of his handlers as they picked him up for feeding. That's when things got weird, or weirder, as the situation already was quite so. Apparently, the idea of formula and bottles wasn't a common practice amongst the staff brought in to care for the boy, Naruto's attitude towards the first maid, who offered him her breast for feeding on the first night of his arrival at Lucifer Mansion, was anything but graceful. To the blonde's defense, the idea felt wrong, this was a grown woman, kind and smiling without hesitance, unaware to whom she held in her arms, she offered her breast for him to suckle on without as much as a thought or idea to how the situation truly was, the idea of, of, feeding in such a manner that left him as embarrassed as it did to make him aware of just how hungry his new body actually was. It was a, surprisingly, difficult decision to make for the blonde child man, feed or hold some level of pride as a husband and former leader of his village. He hadn't experienced the pleasure of a woman in such a way since his wife, hadn't been tempted or considered to pursue anyone else, that knowledge brought him some discomfort at the idea of, even second-handedly, betraying her, it was just to feed and not by any means for pleasure, but the idea did him little good. This turmoil lasted for some time, the maid was insistent and goading the boy in a cute voice, joking with her peers that the boy was a hard one to tempt. That made it worse. Being watched in the act, eventually, the hunger of the newborn's body pressed Naruto to do something he never imagined doing, and thus, after much regret, and a little silent apology, he fed, he was fed routinely in this fashion about once every few hours, his guilt rising as the days passed. This was only one of the many pride-wrecking circumstances of his babification, he wasn't even going to delve into the idea of his new body's bladder control problems. Some things were just too morbid to think about, the initial passing of time was a painful thing for the reborn Hokage. Naruto assumed quickly why children didn't possess much awareness with their initial stages of growth. Their incapacity for much more than drooling left little to be desired for the sake of remembrance, the awareness of his predicament made time seem to almost linger on far longer than it should, and while his body required copious amounts of sleep, which was a thankful reprieve from the limited existence he had been forced into, it was hard to watch the world around him work and move and live while he remained trapped within the fluffy and comfortable confines of his crib. He was routinely visited by the lord of the mansion. The man, his founder, seemed enamored with the little Naruto whenever he had the chance to check on him. The lord Lucifer, as Naruto discovered his name was by listening to passing maids in his crib room, was apparently a man of significant power and respect. He assumed the man must have been quite the warrior or diplomat based on the limited understanding of just what a great Satan was. Unfortunately, the image of a warrior was quickly diminished with the redhead's enamored attitude towards playing, tickling. Naruto laughed, he wasn't proud, and giving baby Naruto attention he never actually received in his own lifetime. Ironic, it took death and resurrection to give him experiences like those given by a father, made awkward based on originally perceived guessing on the age of the red haired man, when Naruto assumed he was probably several decades his elder in mentality. Naruto watched carefully as time passed. His lack of voice and developed motor skills left him to carefully consider the situation he had been placed in and what this meant, even after the months crept past, Naruto couldn't recall anything past saying goodbye to his children. It was a blank, one second, dead, next second, baby, it took time to accept that this was how it was. Naruto remembered, after months of waiting, the first day he even found himself able to sit up straight, with initial assistance from the silver woman, that felt like a small blessing after being only able to lie on his back for so long. Then came the lessons on how to roll over, followed quickly by how to crawl, he could see the maid's surprise on how fast he took to both tasks once they trusted him enough to do anything more than sleep, eat, and occasionally spit up, he hated his baby body. Then he started to walk, six months into his imprisonment, life in the crib, and he was making awkward steps around the mansion's halls, Naruto, who was described as the cutest baby ever by the mansion's maids, smiled like a goofball the entire day, with the silver woman carefully guiding him to ensure he did not harm himself, the lord of the mansion was gushing at the level of awesome his son must have had to be walking so soon. Naruto recalled when he was called his son, that had taken some getting used to, with no small level of hesitance. Next, Naruto started to form words, slowly and quite literally feeling his vocal cords stretch, expand and grow as he did, he couldn't remember what the first word he managed to say clearly, but he remembered being asked to say it again and again by those around, just for laughs, he started to say other, small, believable baby words to the amusement of staff and house owner. Then he learned to run, then he moved out of the crib, then slowly, as months turned to years, the boy who lived in the house of Lucifer grew up for a second time. Mall area, park section, present day air superiority.
angelic energy, strength and speed at near superhuman levels. Weapons constructed from light and sheer willpower. Angels, even fallen angels, were beings not to be trifled with. For thousands of years, the abilities of angels altered very little, large part in due to their unbelievable effectiveness against their arch foes. When humans could not fight the devil onslaught, the angels fought them back. When the age of man seemed to be near its end, the angels ensured its survival. When darkness crept over the corners of the world, the angels held the last light. Even those of different religions, mythologies or legends knew better than to trifle with those whose power was gifted to them by someone who claimed the title of God. Yuma Amano, best known under her true identity as the fallen angel, Rainer, was another who was led by this idea of battle superiority, especially to those of Earth or the underworld. She was proud of her capabilities and felt virtuous in her reasoning behind her actions on the current day at the mall, when there was a threat to the survival of her kind, she had the obligation to prevent its destruction. After all, an angel had the backing of God, right? How could anything they do be wrong? This idealism of strength, reputation and absolute righteousness was not shared by the big damn hero. Ah! Rainer yelled, thrown backwards from the force of the kick thrown to her side by the blonde miscreant just managing to correct her hovering form before hitting the tree line glancing back to her assailant she openly glared as the boy stood atop the park fountain watching her struggle to hold flight crossing his arms naruto gave her a hard look fallen angel he shouted catching the small change in her expression that told him she was surprised at his knowledge who or at least what she was step down the boy is under my protection reynare's teeth gritted into a snarl and just who the hell's protection is he receiving Someone who's stronger than you, Naruto answered, I have no issue with you or your fallen, but the boy is not yours to take on some whim, he waved his hand off to the side, leave, now. His voice was unflinching and left little room for debate, his Hokage voice, as he called it, left Rainer to fume from her position in the air. What infuriated the fallen angel the most was debatable, the blonde's ordering of her to step down, his claim of strength that surpassed her own, the strength of a fallen angel or simply his interruption to the what should have been a quick kill and run for the young woman. Whichever the case, Rainer bared her teeth all the same, holding out her arm as the light around her distorted to form yet another spear. From his position atop the fountain, Naruto watched as the girl, with an obviously practiced hand, twisted around in the air, gathering momentum before tossing the spear towards his head. Naruto had experience with sharp projectiles such as this before, trained to deal with them, so, with a simple twist of his neck to the side, milliseconds before the spear grazed by his head, Naruto proved he was never in any real danger. Staring back to the fallen angel, Naruto's eyes hardened further, are you done? Tisk. I am warning you one last time, fallen angel, leave, I won't tell you a third time, to be honest, he didn't even feel like giving her a second warning, beatdown therapies were something of a specialty of his, but he owed her at least one last chance, out of appreciation to his employer. Fortunately, she had pride issues, which was good, he enjoyed people with pride issues. Made watching them fall on their asses all the more fun. The look in Reynare's eyes took a hint of fury to them, as she brought her hand to the side to form another spear, don't underestimate me. Wouldn't dream of it, Naruto yelled back, leaping down from the fountain as he continued to stare at the girl floating in the air, she was tense, frustrated and packing some serious firepower, but, unlike before, she wasn't throwing the projectile, opting for close-range fighting in the air. This was a wise decision, with any other opponent, Rainer might have had the advantage based on aerial combat expertise, natural aerial beings almost always had an effective edge over those on the ground, if a ground-based opponent felt they had the advantage against an opponent of the air, and hoped to meet them midway for an attack, more often than not they were left with an unsettling surprise that the reality of aerial opponents were not to be trifled with. However, Naruto was not that kind of opponent, taking a couple steps to gain momentum, Naruto leapt at the fallen angel, who raised her spear in preparation for his assault. Feudal, though it was, post-combat survivors often take time to wonder the big what-ifs. In the case of the current conflict, Rainer would wonder several possible outcomes to her challenge with the blonde-haired combatant. What if Shed thrown her spear while the boy was caught mid-air? He couldn't dodge, surely, a quick toss of her spear, five feet before he even got within fist-throwing range, and he would have a spear lodged down his throat, right? What if she dodged his initial attack? Let gravity take hold of him and as he fell, close the distance to his unprotected back with a swift strike to the heart. What if, just for the sake of hypothetical, she went for the down Issei while Naruto was focused on her? A fling of her spear as the blonde attempted to meet her mid-flight, 
too fast to do anything to challenge its trajectory, with Issei having a decent sized hole in his chest. It would be a wound to her pride to admit she couldn't take her blonde opponent, which, at that moment, she couldn't be certain of, but her task would be finished, a threat, eliminated, retreat would be bittersweet, but an accomplishment. Yes, combat, like life, was filled with the what ifs, they could keep you awake at night, wondering what might have been. But this was not a what if, this was reality, this was the present. And presently, Naruto was making his move, Rainair evaluated the distance. 10 meters, 7 meters, 5 meters, she pulled back her spear. 3 meters, she was in the air, her territory, and her opponent was coming to her. She had the advantage with her spear, it had extended length, longer than his arms. She was trained for this, ready for this, 2 meters. Close enough. She pointed her spear forward and gave a thrust of her weight into her weapon, her teeth were grit, her arms were taut, and her knuckles were white with how hard she held onto the spear. This was her win, she thought, she won, looking back to the what ifs, she wondered if she looked into the blonde's eyes, she would have realized her mistake to have even considered challenging such a man. Naruto watched the spear, he watched the twitch of muscles on the fallen angel as she readied her attack, he saw her eyes judging the distance between them and figured she took into consideration the length of her spear to his arms. She was capable, but she was young, she didn't have the experience of life and death situations he had. And in this situation, experience is what mattered most. He watched her eyes, he kept watch on her spear point, he saw it narrow the distance towards his head. It came within a hair's length of his head, then he dodged. Reynare's eyes widened as the blonde's head, like before, moved sharply to the side, her spear grazing past to only clip a couple of yellowish hair. Her eyes widened as her eyes met the monts, he never let his gaze turn away from her. Then his hand went wide, he caught her wrist holding the spear, his other hand went for her bare shoulder, holding tightly to effectively stabilize himself off of the fallen. He twisted her wrist, ah! She screamed, feeling her bones crack as her spear fell from her hand, dissipating into the air before it even touched the ground. Through the pain, she managed to meet his stare, perhaps it was then that she realized her folly. This was no human, it couldn't have been, to cause an angel, a being of considerable endurance, such a shock from a simple wrist tightening did not seem possible. But there wasn't the stench of devil on him, not the smell of a particular mythology or lesser religion, he held no demonic power that she could feel. He felt human, and yet, there was power, Naruto was a man trained, he didn't care that Rainer was female when he nearly broke her wrist, he didn't care when he moved his hand into a fist to drive it into her stomach, he didn't even flinch when he drove his knee right after, Rainer wouldn't hold back, neither would he. Then he performed his finisher, his hand still on her shoulder, Rainer wavered in the air after the severe blows to her abdomen, Naruto took Rainare's attempt to regain composure and air to perform a single armed handstand over her head and shoulders, effectively landing on her back with his hand on her shoulder ensuring he didn't lose hold over the pained woman. Even while holding on to some measure of control of the pain in her body, Reynare's eyes showed her surprise at the blonde's actions, followed shortly by the absolute horror at what came next. With hands moving firmly to grasp around black appendages, Naruto pulled tightly to Reynare's coal-colored wings. Funny thing about the wings of an angel, similar to devils, the wings on the backs of both races were often never seen in a motion similar to flapping. Both races released their individual hidden appendages when they desired so that they might be capable of achieving flight, but beyond that, the wings did no movement to signify that they had any control over the flight patterns of either beings. And in a way, this was true, the wings were largely symbolic for both races, they did not need to move so that their ability to fly could be obtained, devils and angels, using their own form of demonic or angelic energy, respectively, channeled their power into their wings to offer a form of limited gravity control to their person, indeed, aside from that, the wings weren't necessary for much else. It was this idea that the wings of the biblical lore were mainly for show that made others ignore them, it was a rumor spread by both angel and devil. The reason was because the harsh truth was so much worse. Rainer felt the shocks go through her body as Naruto pulled tightly to the wings, thousands of painful needles felt like they were passing through her as the blonde's grip never loosened, she tried shaking, screaming, waving herself in the air to throw him off but it was pointless. He had her, and now the worst thing about having one's wings pulled, the things angels feared most, was happening to her now. They were falling, fast, you idiot. Rainer cried, feeling the air sweep past her as the ground began to close in quickly, she hadn't even realized how high the two of them were before their clash in the sky but apparently, they were quite high, and now, 
they were descending to the ground far too fast for her calm or reserved nature to come in. At this height, the impact would surely, you'll kill us both. No, I want, Naruto's voice, even over the wind, was heard as he watched carefully as he rode the back of the angel down to earth, the ground was catching up quick. He was prepared for this, get ready, to what? To fly. He let go of her wings and jumped, Reynare's eyes clearly showed her surprise, his words alone were what prepared her for the moment he released her wings from his grip, allowing her to once more channel her power into them, even managing to take into account the push off from her back when the blonde made his last minute retreat, Rainer caught her form in the air, barely a foot from what would have been her crushing end. There was a cold sweat coming down her skin, Rainer panted for air she hadn't realized over her fear that her lungs sorely lacked. Her body trembled, she couldn't believe, over that heart pounding moment of falling, that she was still breathing, that despite the soreness in her wrists and wings and the sweat beating down her skin, Rainer of the fallen angels was alive and unharmed. She was alive, she let herself fall from her hovering onto the grass, she couldn't remember the last time she appreciated the feeling of earth so much, being an angel, the air was their home, more so than any other race, but the grass, with its sharp pointed top but still smooth makeup, felt wonderful to her skin. She felt like laughing at the irony of an angel enjoying the surface of the earth had it not been for the shadow that loomed over her then. Remember that feeling, angel. Naruto's voice never seemed to crack or waver as beautiful young angel lifted her head to stare at him, remember. This is what happens when you bite off more than you can chew. Then he turned from her and walked in the direction of the fountain. Issei was probably still there, the blonde doubted he would have left, under both the barrier and Naruto's words, Issei would have been too nervous to have done much of anything. And besides, Rainer got the message, his employer would be pleased. Propping herself up onto her arms before slowly moving onto her knees, Rainer stared at the retreating form of the blonde, no fear or unease was evident on his features. He planned this, right down to the moment, he planned his win and made her out to be the fool. But now, as Rainer watched him walk away, she wondered, was it his win? Rainer glared to his bare back, before pulling her arm to the side, amidst the stress and relief of being alive, she could feel the pull of energy as she focused it into her wrist, she was careful, careful not to let the hero see her focus or the light coming from her hand, his defenses were down, his consideration of her gone, believing her defeated, but he was wrong. She was a fallen angel. The strongest of the three factions, trained in the art of combat since she was a child by the magnificent Azazel himself. She was not some dog to be put down by some, some, boy in his pretend belief that he was some hero. She slowly began to twist the energy, slowing giving it substance and form, as she moved to stand with one leg on the ground and froze, she stared at him, the boy man hero person, she stared at him as he walked away. He didn't so much as bother to look over his shoulder, he was certain in his victory over her. It was weird, she recalled what he did to her not a minute ago. The falling, the anxiety, the belief that it was the end. How calm he was, he didn't fear what came next, he either had the acceptance of what might occur or the belief he would survive. And those ideas terrified her, she fell to her knees again, arms holding her body up as she panted and felt stinging tears fall from her eyes. I almost died, I almost died. I almost died I almost died I almost died I almost died I almost died. Naruto stood from the corner of a tree, effectively hidden from the downed angel, as he watched her eventually stand with a look of almost hollow acceptance to what had occurred before taking off in a shaky flight pattern to parts unknown, the barrier fell around the park area, showing the night sky and the mall now lit from the inside. Naruto nodded, accepting the turn of events, before going back to Issei. Like he figured, the boy hadn't moved, perhaps he had a nice show as Naruto dished out some of the good old-fashioned pain train on his girlfriend, perhaps he just couldn't feel his legs after seeing such brutality on both parties' parts, perhaps he was just obedient, either way, he didn't move much from where Naruto left him. Which was perfect, because Naruto knew what he had to do. Issei. Naruto spoke up, kneeling beside the boy as he got his attention, he was in some form of mild shock, judging by his eyes, Naruto lightened his tone somewhat, how you feeling? Issei stared at him, fine, just yeah, Naruto nodded, expected as much, I expect you have a lot of questions, huh? Issei hesitated before offering a shaky nod, and you're probably not too sure what to make of everything you saw here, hum. Again, Issei nodded, Naruto nodded with him, thinking everything over, alright, I can give you answers, but first, I am going to need you to answer a question. Issei waited a moment before speaking, what question? Naruto lifted his hand, what did the five fingers say to the face? What? 
smack in the circumstances throughout modern history, where a human discovered the existence of angels, devils or some other form of mythical being by accident, certain measures were taken to ensure they and other viewing parties would not relay such discovered information to anyone. Previously, the technique was called mass slaughtering. Thankfully, the realization that this caused more problems than solutions was realized, thus, each race soon began developing techniques that, on the weak-willed, unconscious or shocked minds of humans, Work to remove the memories of what had previously occurred, this left fewer humans dead and caused less strife among the worlds and religious factions. Naruto, however, knew no such technique, truthfully, that moment at the park was not one of Naruto's better moments, in fact, this might have been a move that went under the category of risky and stupid at the same time, he hadn't done something like that since he was a teen, well, a teen before the teen he was now, past teen life, whatever. He panicked. He wasn't sure how to deal with this sort of situation so he figured the shocked mind, knock unconscious, thinks it's all a pretty dream idea sounded pretty good. Sadly, reality kicked in and he realized he had more work to do. Issei Hyoto's body wasn't heavy, not at all, really, but carrying him around on rooftops, avoiding wandering eyes and potential bystanders, even at nighttime, was proving somewhat difficult and time-consuming. This wasn't Konoha, where people jumping over rooftops was a daily norm. What I wouldn't do for a transport spell right now, Naruto thought to himself, but he had to keep this under wraps, no calling mom for this mess, his employer would not be pleased if he half asked this at the end. Thus, with a mindset of determination he held since he was a kid in both of his lives, Naruto made his way carefully into the Hyodo residence. Thankfully, Issei wasn't one to lock his window on the usually busy street of his house, with a quick tug, Naruto opened it to the inside of the pervert's bedroom moved inside with Issei slouched on his back and quietly moved to place the boy on his futon. Taking a moment to relax, Naruto looked over the boy's room, it was about what he expected, magazines, books, DVDs 90% of which was porn, desk, dresser, clothes, posters, porn-oriented, it was homey, for its simplicity, it vaguely reminded Naruto of his old apartment, minus the intense sexy girl-themed collectibles. Funny how moving into a house in, post-death, being raised in large mansions gave one a perspective of simplicity. Naruto sighed, stretching out his limbs as he reached down into the boy's pockets and pulled out his phone. Over the last week, when Naruto was keeping protective observation over the boy and his girlfriend, Naruto knew that Issei had been rather attached to the girl through digital devices. Going through Issei's phone, Naruto searched for what he needed, thankfully, Issei was very thorough on naming things, so finding what he needed was no trouble for Naruto. Awesome Ominous email address. Delete. You my girl's social network profile page address. Delete. Best. Girlfriend. Ever. Phone number. Delete. Yuma Amano photos. Naruto hesitated there. In the small folder of Issei's phone, there was a group of photos with Yuma Aminos, Reynare's, face in every one of them. The folder seemed to be carefully organized. Each picture depicted Yuma as some sort of laughing, smiling, happy or joking manner. There were even some with Issei in them smiling brightly as he took the photos with enthusiasm, they didn't even seem explicitly sexual or dirty in nature, which surprised the blonde, though a few did seem to get good shots of the top of her breasts during their date together. In the end, though, the two seemed, generally, happy. Naruto looked down from the phone to the boy sleeping off the knockout hit to the forehead, head be out till morning, at least. Issei really liked this Yuma, the photos, the smiles, the interactions, he cared for the disguise of Rainer. Naruto wouldn't deny him as much, he was a serious pervert whom Naruto caught more than a few times staring profusely at the fallen angel's bust, even as she was trying to skewer him, but he had his saving graces. He was a boy who still had the capacity to love and be loved like anyone else. Delete, but still, it needed to be done, placing the phone back into his pocket, the slight shifting of his clothing knocked a loose piece of parchment from his jacket's inside pocket, it caught Naruto's eye, brightly glaring over the light from the window as he reached over and picked up the folded paper carefully. He opened it and glanced over the contents, the bizarre formation of runes and circles was the first thing that caught his eye. Caught it, because the symbol was very familiar, pursing his lips, Naruto folded the flyer and placed it into his back pocket, holding back a groan. Rias, complex apartments, south end of city, a few minutes later. So, mission accomplished, right? Depends, am I still obligated to watch the boy? Hum na. I think we've established he's not to be disturbed just fine, nice work, by the way, fear tactics ha, huh? very ninja, couldn't have done it better myself. No, you couldn't, will that be all? 
Are we clear on what I owe? Yep. We're clear as Gabriel's horn. Both of them. I am not going to even ask what that meant. The other end of the phone died, as a middle-aged man laughed outside his apartment, clicking the phone shut and moving to go back to the comfort of the indoors. The man fit the look of, for lack of better terms to describe him by. A bachelor, he was tall, opting to wearing a loosely fitted, grayish kimono, even as it grew colder outside, and wore a pair of similarly loose sandals, facial-wise, the man might have been considered quite handsome, tan skin, boasting a goatee that had to have been trimmed and cleaned on a regular basis to get the sharpness that it had, with long, mixed-colored golden and black hair that seemed natural but should NT have been possible. He walked with a casual step back into his apartment, smiling an almost victorious smile, as he looked to his guest who sat silently by herself. Raina Chan, he spoke up, as the long-haired fallen angel, Rainer, looked away from the small television in the room to offer a glance back to the man. How are you feeling? The mon's tone was soft, it made Rainer blush in embarrassment for needing his assistance, she was a proud fallen angel, damn it. I I am fine, she said, trying to put as much pride into her voice, even with her disheveled appearance, though the stuttering didn't help her position. After her fight with the blonde warrior, Rainer attempted to recover her strength as best as she knew how. Returning to the underworld, with her well-supplied stock of tools and items, her home could see to her resting and healing needs, but at the moment, before she even opened a portal to vacate the planet, she recalled her lord's command. She was to stay on Earth, so, with gritted teeth, she realized she couldn't return to the temporary confines Shed made for herself since arriving on the different world, it was too far away and she was weakening fast, she considered other angel locations, but quickly struck the idea down, they would laugh at her, she was aiming to raise her position amongst those who stood beside her, to make those around her know that she wasn't just a child who'd been taken in out of pity or mercy. No, she couldn't go to the other angels, but, then, the man standing behind her wasn't like the others, was he? He was the one who, even during her fits, would not judge or throw her away. Said man smiled, I am glad, you know, you had me in quite the shock when you dropped down here, I thought you might have done something you should NT have, his tone was in jest and his smile offered no knowing of anything beyond her sudden arrival to his abode. Rainer had the courtesy to look abashed, however, oh of course not. I I I was, I w wouldn't she shook her head profusely, trying to shake off her embarrassment. The man smiled, offering a faint chuckle to himself, children, relax, relax. I believe you, he assured her, watching as her face blushed further and gave a curt nod so as to not say something unprecedented again. She was eating his food, lying on his couch, wearing a spare outfit he owned as her leathery dress was fixed and using the sheer energy of his presence to slowly heal her sore and wounded body, she was easing her battered body and soul off of a caretaker she swore, years ago, she would not need any more. And through it all, he could see her shame, shame in herself as only a prideful angel could feel, the shame that was driving her mad from the inside out. She was gripping the arm of his couch tightly, shaking briefly before turning with a blushing red face and shouting. Thank you again for taking this worthless sheep into your home, Azazel Sama. I will be sure to pay back this immense kindness you have bestowed upon me a hundred times over. I swear it. One second, she was on the couch, the next, she was on her knees, bowing deeply to her keeper. The man, now known as Azazel, blinked at the display in words before laughing loud and deeply, All right, all right, enough of that, no need for the theatrix, I am just glad you're all right, can't tell you how nervous you made me, coming in as you did, that was a semi-lie, on any other day or circumstance, perhaps the words would have been more truthful, but he trusted his hired help to see his will done, and the results were to his liking, just relax, it'll make you another ramen cup. You know, I am not sure why, but I have found them to be the most enjoyable things of late. Miso, pork, chicken, all of them, they really are delectable. Rainer nodded, tea that would be most kind, am my lord, she stuttered out, as Azazel smiled and made his way into the kitchen, humming a tune as he made to make more food. Rainer sat back on the couch, she was hardly watching, whatever it was that was on the black box, her mind was elsewhere. The blonde, that blonde, cold blue-eyed man beat her, sent her running with her wings in her arms and with a cold sweat to make things worse, he got her heart pumping like no foe ever had, she believed herself a growing elite in the fallen angel ranks, that her lack of experience in actual combat mattered little in comparison to the sheer mental, magical and physical training she put herself through to win over the affections and approval of her peers and superiors. But he proved her wrong, she was nowhere near ready for the title of lord among the fallen. How many times had she sweat and cried to get to where she was? 
How many had laughed at her ambitious attitude when she said she would be the next leader of Grigori? How had the grievances of those who put her down, not only of the fallen angels, only made her strive to prove she was not just a freeloader to her people? How could they point at her and say she was not a true angel? She, the untrue child of heaven? And now, as she stood amongst the leaders of her faction on earth, how must the others have looked at her when she was told to babysit the sacred gear pervert? It was a wound. A wound to her pride and her belief in herself, that she had been placed, not among the defenders or caretakers of those who were truly holy under the sky of God, but as some crotch hugger's new nanny. The idea made her want to vomit, she stood by, for weeks, watching him, the disgusting little toad, his actions to the females around him made her no less impressed with the human race than she had been ten years ago. Though, perhaps they were not cockroaches, she would admit bitterly, her lords seemed to find something admirable about the growing population and their worth, though she could not see what they did, to her, they were the grounded, unblessed beings whom, only after accepting their rightful place as those below their true father, could ascend truly in value to her. But Issei was beyond redemption, his attitudes were purely based on lust, how unbecoming, in all manners of the word, she couldn't even prevent his actions without direct interference, which was forbidden to her. She lasted a month, watching him, one could hardly blame her when she decided to take matters into her own hands soon after that. She figured this was a test, it had to have been, sacred gears were dangerous and this boy, stupid, though he was, could have posed a threat to the great faction of the fallen angels, humans had done so before, why would that change now? Her lord Azazel must have realized this, must have been testing her, to see if she had the qualities to take action and realize the danger for herself. The boy was perverse incarnate, an evil quality, it had to be snuffed out before it could fester and grow. She told herself this throughout the time she knew him as Yuma Amano, she even started to make it a game, feeling she earned as much, maybe she would even get creativity points from her peers for the ingenious way she went about dealing with potential threat. It had all been planned, almost realized, and then he showed up. And now, here she was, licking her wounds and pride like some struck down puppy. Her fingers dug into the leathery couch, this was not over, not by a long shot. This was a minor setback to a major dream she held. The desire to prove that the fallen were not just the outcasts that the other factions believed them to be, that they had hearts, feelings and power to challenge those who would see them crumble and fall back into the shadows of perdition. She would get stronger. Prove her worth to everyone. And when the time came and she found the strength to challenge that blonde-haired hero she would. Hey! Reina Chan! The shout knocked the female fallen angel out of her internal rant perking her up as she answered, why yes, my lord? You know, with everything that was going on, I almost forgot to ask. How did you get into such a mess, hum? Rainer paused in thought, what would make her come out, wounded and sore, looking as she did? I fell down some stairs, you fell down some stairs? Yes, stairs? There were a lot of them a red-haired young woman smiled to herself, not seeming to take note of the common rabble that stood around her, ogling her, as she made her way through the front doors of the academy. The young woman, who held the name of Rias Gremory with pride, was accurately portrayed and worshipped by her student body admirers. Rias was a fairy tall, slender woman, with a seemingly delicate frame that matched with her ample curves. Peach-colored skin and long, flawless legs, her eyes were a deep, reflective blue and her long, captivating crimson hair held such a sense of majestic that every man who glanced in her direction felt their blood boil, she wore, like the rest of the female body, who now stood by with envy as they glanced over her perfect features, the standard uniform, with exception to the fact her choice in appearance seemed to hold back very little of her rather, gifted figure. The situation she was walking into, where the students stood aside to watch her enter with her naturally acquired grace. Was nothing new, Rias always held a strong sense of presence, this practice of the student body giving her space was almost a daily occurrence, with her natural allure and poise standing out amongst the students around her. Her confident stride hadn't changed in the three years since her enrollment, Rias held herself at a level, befitting her position, as one of the deemed two great ladies of Kuo Academy. She was the unobtainable, the beautiful president of the occult research club, she didn't play to the crowd's affection. That wasn't her thing, she was a determined, confident woman who felt the need to do what was necessary, nothing more, nothing less, mingling with her envious or lustful onlookers wasn't what she came to school to do. Unlike the normal routine of arriving to the academy early. Today was a twist from Rias' usual routine, for one. She was walking into the academy without her close confidant. Vice president and best friend, Akeno Himejima, after all, the two had known each other, even prior to enrolling, they were almost always seen together, 
as Akeno also held the second title of one of the two great ladies, and to those who near obsessed over the women on a daily basis, this might have struck them as odd, they weren't joined at the hip, though some boys might have dreamt of it, but it was of some note to the onlookers around the redhead. Unknown to her observers, there was a twist to step that morning, her stride was only slightly faster, her hands were tightly held fists, and her eyes scanned ahead for any unusual sightings. She was nervous, and without her loyal friend by her side, even more so, though a part of her knew that there was no reason to be, another part said that she should be wary. Wary of what, though, was a subject of annoyance. She wasn't in any danger, that, she was certain of, of all the things that might have occurred during the day, or might not occur, as she silently hoped, fear of pain or retribution was not one of them. She was mentally preparing herself, though, that, at least, was the most she could do. She climbed the stairs past her fans, listening as the voices slowly drifted away, aiming for the second floor of the academy to enter her homeroom. Honestly, why she was even surprised to find a mess of blonde hair on a tall boy waiting for her at the top was beyond her. He enjoyed it, she guessed, the surprise, the look people's faces when he appeared where you were heading or knew where to talk privately without anyone barring their reason for conversation. Glancing to the sides of the lengthy hall of the main academy building, she saw no wandering students or teachers coming to check out the disturbance between them, how the blonde managed such a feat as to give them this limited amount of privacy eluded her. Her blue eyes met his, he didn't have that innocent playfulness she often saw in them. She watched him as he stepped off the wall, she reached the top of the second floor steps as he made his way to her, if she stood still it wasn't out of acknowledgement of the blonde's presence, she was just coming to the knowledge that the boy was not happy. But that wasn't the unsettling part, he didn't seem angry, either, this left her with confusion to go along with her growing unease. The boy reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out something small and folded up neatly, Rias glanced to it, watching as he showed off the small flyer in his hands, hoping her face didn't show the surprise or lack of confidence to his presence, she recognized the symbols and runes, she had to have printed thousands of copies of the same glyphic combination and understood what was being asked. She pursed her lips, Prideful and confident Rias was caught with her hand in the cookie jar and she didn't have an explanation to give. At least, not yet, I will send Kiba to pick you up after class. Rias' first words to the boy, despite her growing nerves. Sounded strong and confident, not backing down or offering a stutter as she straightened her stature and looked at the blonde staring her down. This would give her time. Time to think of what to say or how to go about what the blonde was surely going to ask, to even the playing field. She needed Akano and her advice on how to handle the situation that was coming. Akano was just as aware of the blonde's unprecedented occurrence at the mall area as she was and would certainly help her in assuaging the situation. Thankfully, the blonde was not unreasonable, he didn't say a thing back, just folded up the flyer, placed it in his back pocket, and stepped aside the red haired princess of Kuo Academy to walk to the first floor from where she came. Rias listened to his footsteps slowly dim in sound as they merged with the echoes of students conversing with one another below. She didn't dodge the bullet, she just prolonged its time of impact so she could reach for the Kevlar. She walked in the direction of class, her face finally took on a look of frustration and red to match her hair as she knew the school day was ruined for her, she would be thinking of her upcoming confrontation, which would leave her equal parts irritable, flustered and hot from their moment together. Because the boy who ruined her day was none other than Naruto Uzumaki, her oldest friend, her childhood prankster, her unofficial nephew. And the boy she loved, Classroom for Class 2B, Kuo Academy, 5.02 p.m. Issei Hyodo was asking questions, Naruto didn't know what to make of this, maybe his hope for a knockout, dream out scenario with the fallen angel had been hoping for too much. Sure. Getting rid of the evidence from the boy's personal device helped in his erasing of Yuma from Issei's existence, but Naruto realized, soon after waking from the night before, that everyone who came in contact with the young woman would be asking questions, that the people who knew Yuma would be going around trying to find the missing girl. Maybe hoping it would blow over was a poor move on my part, Naruto initially thought, as he made his way to the academy. But his fears were unfounded, because, to anyone Issei asked, the response was the same. Who's Yuma? Yuma? I don't think I know a girl like that. You? With a girlfriend? Snort, and this continued, no one knew anyone by Issei's description, his lack of digital evidence didn't help matters either. He seemed confused and disoriented by what was going on, wondering if it was just some huge prank by his friends and classmates. Naruto felt bad at that. The thought that you were part of some joke couldn't have been easy. Rainer, despite her hostility, seemed to be keeping her word and staying away from Kuo and Issei. In fact, 
It was Naruto's suspicion that this mass erasure of Yuma Amino's existence was probably her doing, cutting loose ends, perhaps. Oddly attentive for a fallen angel who just had her backside firmly handed to her. But aside from the convenience of the erasure, it also came with the consequence of Issei, who seemed to have been missed on the erasing scheme. The boy was now desperate in his attempts at finding answers on Yuma's whereabouts. It made Naruto feel worse when Issei came to ask him about the last time he saw Yuma Amano. Yuma Amano. Yeah, at the park, remember? Everyone seems to not know who she is but you saw her with me at the mall, right? Yu Yu. Naruto could tell the boy was trying to say how he fought her in a mid-air battle, seemingly to the death, but how do you describe that, believably? Uh, sorry, uh, Izzy. Issei. Right, right, Issei, but, uh, I don't really remember a girl like that, I mean, if she was a good looking as you say she was, with the awesome body, luscious hair, and great tits, as Issei described her, then I think I do remember her, right? Naruto played it off innocent, he didn't know Issei in public, he had to keep that illusion. And Issei, confused and disoriented, didn't know how to react to it all, no way, his eyes widened, not even you. He walked away after that, keeping largely to himself as the day passed by without much incident beyond the norm. Naruto watched over him, even without it being a job of his anymore, he seemed depressed and even sulking quietly in his chair, but he didn't seem to be dying inside, with any luck, a couple days from now, Issei would just figure the whole thing was some wonderfully cruel dream. But now, at the end of the day coming to a close, Naruto prepared himself to be summoned, and if there wasn't a better warning sound that now was the time to get moving, it was the sound of screaming girls that woke him to the new presence in the room. Yuto Kiba, the star pretty boy of Kuo Academy and member of the Occult Research Club. A handsome young man with short, smooth blonde hair. Pale gray eyes and naturally soft-toned skin, he was of average height. Perhaps just around Issei's stature, and wore the standard male school outfit. Except with obvious amounts of care pushed into it, as the thing almost seemed to be pressed and cared for extensively by the boy, he was smart, athletic, kind and struck Naruto as very similar to a couple of old friends he once knew, both by the basis of name, exceptional ability in class and had the girls practically eating out of his hands, his mulling and considerate personality had a winning quality to it that made him easy to get along with. He also happened to be a close friend of Naruto's for several years. That was smart of Rias, out of everyone in her little group, sending Kiba was probably best, he had a way of being the only sane guy in their group, maybe had talked Naruto out of his little episode, Rias hoped. Kiba-kun. Oh, Kaba-kun. W what are you doing at this part of the school? A are you here to see me? No, he's here to see me. The girls of Naruto's classroom, all surrounding the new addition to the room with smiles and blushing faces, made Issei, Naruto noticed, glare openly, Kiba's attention and natural success with women was the envy, Naruto even admitted he was surprised by how effective the pretty boy was with women, though not showing any particularly strong emotions to one in particular. He was just kind and treated them equally, and that seemed to be enough. You're all looking lovely, this evening, Kiba spoke up from the center of the girl mob, as the girls quickly returned his praises with fervor. Naruto mulled quietly for a moment, perhaps enjoying the show of female obsession, before sitting up, patting down his jacket over his shoulders, and walking to the object of womanly affection, it was time to get serious. Let's go, Naruto said, making sure his voice was heard over the girls as he patted Kiba on the shoulder to get his attention before moving past and towards the direction of the nearest main academy building exit. Kiba saw his retreating form, his job of delivering him to his president was quickly being taken away from him, hey, Naruto, wait up, I am supposed to deliver you, wait, Yuto-san, don't leave us, why are you leaving so soon, Kiba ku yu 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 n n n n n n n kuo academy, old school building, Naruto's walk was fast as Kiba made to keep up, all the way through the school grounds, Kiba attempted to persuade Naruto to loosen up on whatever he was clearly focused on. Though Kiba was unaware for the reasoning behind Naruto's summons from the president, Kiba was there to see it through, he was Naruto's friend, after all, along with being the president's, he had no interest in seeing either of them fighting one another, if he could help it, so, using placating words of peace had learned from his sensei, Kiba attempted to slacken the hard expression from Naruto's face, even a little because had only seen Naruto get this way once before, and people got hurt. I am telling you, Naruto, whatever the issue might be I am sure it is no reason to be upset about. Naruto was usually one for conversation, the fact he wasn't responding wasn't a good sign in Kiba's opinion, in fact, 
Based around the complete twist in Naruto's personality, the young man had a clear idea in mind that something was, indeed, not in the norm for his longtime friend, he was right. Naruto navigated the familiar hallways of the old school building to the second floor, coming to a door with lit candles at its sides, Naruto pressed it open and walked inside with a heavy stride. The room was dimly lit, with several candles standing at or around the tables surrounding the room, there were a pair of comfortable couches surrounding a nicely set table in the middle of the room, with various bookshelves covering the walls, each filled with dozens of old scriptures that almost looked archaic to the eye, there were old paintings adorning any free walls that could be found and the window in the room was closed to block off the view of the lowering sun from outside. From his place at the door, Naruto noted he might have had trouble, once upon a time, figuring out the general layout to the comfortably designed room, the candles helped, but they weren't the most efficient of light sources, his past experiences in dimly lit places and his new early life in the similarly lit Lucifer mansion were the only reasons he wasn't squinting his eyes to get a clear view of everything around him. As it were, as Naruto and Kiba entered the designated club room of the old school building, Naruto realized Rias had thought her plan of dealing with Naruto quite well, because the two blondes were not the only individuals in the room. Sitting on one of the couches, a young, silver-haired girl sat quietly to herself, she was an interesting addition to the room, she was certainly younger than the two gentlemen, but by how much was uncertain, she wore the high school variation of Kuo Academy's dress code, but her appearance could not have been older than that of a middle school student, indeed, looking at this young woman, Naruto was vaguely reminded of Gasper, both in stature and height. Needless, though, Naruto recognized her, Kaneko, Naruto greeted, his voice still hard but not unfriendly, as he moved into the room with Kiba. The 15-year-old, Kaneko Taju, looked up from her place on the couch, Naruto noticed a bar of chocolate on a toothpick being slowly savored by the girl, Naruto-san, she greeted back, though the girl's tone was so monotonous, Naruto had difficulty telling if she was pleased to see him or not, it's been a while. A couple weeks, yes, Naruto replied, moving to sit in the opposite couch to Kaneko's, as he made himself comfortable for Rias' arrival, how have you and Kiba been? Kiba relaxed slightly, Naruto was talking now, at least, as Kaneko answered him, fine, she finished the chocolate on the stick, reaching for another from the plate on the table between them, you? Kaneko was a girl of few words, I've been busy, hum, Kaneko took a bite of chocolate, with what? Oh, you know, stuff, Naruto answered with a shrug, studying his friends closely, Kiba looked confused at the word choice and Kaneko offered nothing except for eating more chocolate, so he focused on Kaneko, you know why I am here? You found a club flyer, I did, why's that a problem? It was found under questionable circumstances, questionable? It was found under someone who was about to die, Kaneko went for another chocolate, this has happened before. A bit of a coincidence, don't you think, especially with a fallen involved? Life's full of surprises, I know it is, this surprise, however, doesn't surprise me as it should. Hmm. Kiba watched the two go back and forth with their bantering, he hardly understood the situation beyond what Akino, the club's vice president, had given him, Naruto wanted words with Rias, that wasn't much to go off of, but he trusted his friends, hearing there was trouble between them was, disconcerting. Speaking of the vice president, Kiba turned his head as to just behind Naruto's couch to see the woman herself walk in, all smile and cute as she came. Naruto turned his attention to Akano Himejima, like the rest of the occupants in the room, had known her for a long time. Long before even their days at the academy, Akano Himejima was a very elegant and gentle woman. With her easing personality offered both a motherly touch and a teasing edge to herself, she was of average height, with raven-colored hair that was easily longer than Rias' own, had it not been for the orange ribbon keeping it from hitting the ground, she was slim and very well endowed, not even Naruto would deny that, her eyes were violet and glistened playfully as she stepped beside Naruto, leaning over the couch. Her smile was kind, peaceful, relaxed and so fake Naruto wondered when had ever get to see a real one. Oh my! Is Naruto-chan upset? Akano asked playfully, as Naruto tried to keep his face hard for his confrontation with Rias, though it was steadily getting hard to do so. Having friends around him made it difficult to stay frustrated, especially with their happy and playful, even in Kaneko's case, attitudes. ITD been a while since they'd all gotten together like this, Naruto needed to frequent the club room more often, he guessed. Not upset, Naruto answered, just curious what's going on, he reached into his pocket to pull out the flyer, I assume you knew about this. I did, Akano said, Reaching over to pluck the flyer from his hands, Rias and I noticed how much attention Issei Hyoto was getting and decided we wanted to figure out why. 
Naruto's lips pursed, without giving him a choice? Akano brushed ruffles from her skirt, it wasn't our place to interfere with fallen angel matters. So you'd let him die? Naruto's voice didn't have an edge to it like he thought it should. Akano seemed ready for his question, save one human boy and start a war with the city's fallen angels, or turn him after the angels' tasks were done, without provocation or irritation on either faction's parts. Akano pushed away from the couch, it seemed like an easy decision. Naruto paused for a second, that's right, they don't know that the angels' attack was unsanctioned. That helped, a little, maybe, in growing age, Naruto realized the world was more gray than black and white, he understood that but didn't change his opinion on some choices that irked his sense of right and wrong, even with being raised under a household of devils, the recent actions of his friends nipped at the edges of his moral conscience. Rias and I were expecting some sort of signal from the flyer the night before, Akano continued, moving around the couch to lay beside Naruto, looking collected and calm as ever, imagine our surprise when nothing came, so, we had our little team mascots keep an eye on the situation, Akino's hand was raised, as brief flicker of a small, green and fat oni appeared before disappearing into thin air, her team mascots, as they were. Now, imagine our surprise after they tell us you were fighting the fallen angel. Kiba was standing beside the couch, listening and trying to fill the blanks from information he wasn't given prior, he wasn't used to being out of the loop, this didn't annoy him, but it did require him to study the two halves of the arguing party in the room. Naruto, to his credit, didn't seem phased at the accusation, I was taking a walk, saw what was going on, thought I could help. That's very kind of you to help a stranger like that. He's a classmate of mine, felt wrong to just leave him for an angel. I don't doubt you. Akino's smile was unwavering, Naruto's eyes narrowed in slight annoyance, yes you do. Oh my. You wound me, Naruto-chan. Would I lie to you? You know I believe you are a good, kind man, she placed her hand on her chest smiling but trying to come off as offended for being accused of such a thing as to lie to one of her favorite persons in all the worlds. Naruto pursed his lips, Rias was playing chess with his emotions, weakening him before he could confront her on what was going on, and sadly, Naruto felt it was working. Where's Rias? Right here, a voice yelled from behind the group. As they all turned to see Rias Gremory walk into the room. A towel in her hand as she dried the last bits of loose hair from her face, Obviously, she was using the building's shower system again, I apologize for my delay, Naruto. I was so tired from work the night prior I didn't get a chance to clean myself this morning, in truth, her panic during the day caused her to sweat and smell before long, she used the shower to up her confidence and add additional time to think over what to say to her blonde nephew. Naruto stood from the couch, that's fine, he said, hoping the edge in his voice was still there to show his disapproval of her recent actions taken, though I was hoping we could talk in private. Rias nodded, putting the towel away to side, this is what she expected and, perhaps, even wanted a little, that will be fine, she said, turning to her club mates, Akano, will you inform Kiba on any missing details? I wasn't very vocal about the situation earlier. Akano nodded, standing beside Naruto as she smiled and gave a curt bow to Rias, as you wish, bucko, she motioned to Kaneko and Kiba to the door, as the two regular members of the club made their way out in a disciplined manner. Akano moved around Naruto and towards the door, but not before offering him a slight touch of her hand to his own, it was a simple brush of her fingers but Naruto thought he understood her message. Be gentle. Rias made her way around the room, sitting down to her desk and moving into a position she liked, she was arranging her position as president and top dog of the room she and Naruto now occupied, so, she started off, what would you like me to say? Naruto walked over to the front of her desk, as he did so, Rias noticed how tall he stood in comparison to her sitting position, this was a challenge, I want to know why you would do such a thing. His voice wasn't playful, he wanted his answers and he was using an intimidation position to get them, but Rias was proud and strong, she wasn't one for intimidation. She sat up straighter, meeting his hard expression with her own, in what regard do you refer to? Why were you attempting to convert Issei Hyodo into your little? Naruto tried to think of a word for what Rias' little group was, the original word in terms of Rias, club. It was, perhaps, looking back now, because of his apathetic nature towards the true word of Rias' group that made it so easy to take the first strike against Naruto in this argument between the two, Rias saw it, Naruto realized only too late in his wording that he appeared weak in his incapability of saying that one word. And Rias jumped him on it, peerage, Naruto, her tone was every bit the gremory air she was meant to be, standing smoothly from her chair to look at the boy at eye level, the word is peerage, I wanted Issei in my peerage, I wanted him to become a devil's servant, to me. Then, 
For added effect, Rias allowed her wings to slide from their hidden position, winning the first round in her morality debate in a flashy display. A devil's peerage, a fancy word for a fancy group. A devil's peerage was a group of individuals, humans, inhumans, beasts and so on, who were turned into devils. To go over the vastness of history around how this thing called a peerage came to be. Looking back to the Great War of the Three Factions and the Civil War of the Devils would be the precipice for even the need for the order of a peerage. The two wars that shook the Devil Foundation left the structure of the 72 pillars, and even the Order of Devilkind, on the brink of collapse, the angelic factions were stronger than they were, stronger than the original opposition to their defense, if such a thing remained, the Devils believed, in retaliation, the Fallen and the Angels might unify themselves once more in the face of a common, weakened foe. And that is when the idea of a defensive plan, created amidst the great Satans and High Lords of the Underworld was formed. The idea of the Devil's Peerage, originally developed by the great Satan. Ajuka Beelzebub, Ajuka saw this method as not only a way to offer defense against potential threats, but also as a way to replenish the number of Devil Warriors amongst their ranks, after all, like with every faction involved in the Great War, not every citizen was bred or built for combat, through searching for capable warriors from any race, with using either willing or desperate consent, a devil could transform an individual into a being of the underworld. To live, join and fight for their new race, these new devils were referred to as reincarnated devils. The High Lords, who were given dominion over the idea and allowance to create peerages of their own, were astounded by this idea, and indeed, it was brilliantly thought of. This system would, and could, ensure their continued thriving culture. Heck, with the new additions into the society, culture would evolve with new ideas and perceptions, and, as an added incentive to the newly joined or hesitant, the opportunity that even a non-pureblood devil might be able to achieve high position among all who lived in the vast underworld was also readily made known, so long as their worth was proven through hard work and determination. The method appeared to be a strong step forward in the form of developing a newer, more openly accepted devil society. But, as with any newly crafted system, it was not without flaws. Ajuka was limited by how much a devil could spread their existence, because, despite angelic belief, devils truly did have souls, and with every individual a single devil turned, a piece of their existence twisted and morphed into the intended target, this method changed their anatomy and allowed the ability to channel and use demonic energy freely, this alchemic technique was very effective and popular amongst most of the population. But, to the matter of souls, a devil could only recover after spreading their existence out so much without permanent or influenced injury. Ajuka estimated, with a competent devil of strength and power, roughly 15 spreads of existence, or so, was enough to not cause permanent damage to either party. Ajuka spread this knowledge to his people and developed a way to create a controlled method of transference of essence, using a high-class devil's power, who he assumed would be the only ones to meet the bare minimum of capability and strength for the transference process to work. He created, based off his favorite human game, the controlled peerage-making tools known as the Evil Pieces. The Evil Pieces were a marvel of innovation, a true power of creativity by devilkind. Ajuka was praised for his accomplishments, which he took nonchalantly, he was an inventor, he enjoyed his work because it was work worth doing. The Evil Pieces comprised the power of devilkind essences into five categories and numbers. One queen, two rooks, two bishops, two knights, and eight pawns, each group of piece offered selective abilities that enhanced those given one, and were given a system of worth as that of what perceived pawns were worth. The queen. The least given type of evil piece to a high-class devil, but also the believed most powerful, they are commonly worth nine pawns in the game of chess and evil piece worth, they held aspects of power similar to the rooks, knights and bishops, although perhaps not to the same extent, this was the top gun of a peerage ruler. The rook. An attack and defense type evil piece given to a high-class devil, these were the brutes of one's peerage, they are commonly worth five pawns in the game of chess and evil piece worth, they held immense offensive and defensive power, though weren't commonly known for huge amounts of speed. The bishop. The magical expert evil piece given to a high-class devil, these were the healers and sorcerers of one's peerage, they were worth equivalently three pawns, their magical abilities were unparalleled, but physically were not the most excelled by their reincarnation into devils. The knight. The speed and mobility evil piece given to a high-class devil, they were the cavalry men, they, like bishops, are worth three pawns, their speed is greatly enhanced to incredible levels, their physical abilities are also enhanced, except not nearly to the level of a rook's. The pawn. The most given type of evil piece to a high-class devil, 
they are unique in their unusual structure of being able to take over aspects of the other types, depending on where they stand in the world of battle, with the permission of the peerage leader, they can take on the aspects of knight, bishop, rook, or even queen when spurred, they are the most underrated of pieces, but also potentially the most dangerous. An effective method of growth for devilkind, and a peerage's lord, who was referred to as their king, was named, so did the masses feel that it would be appropriate to name their peerage members, after all, calling them by their peace names felt inappropriate so the high lords gave them one. Whether it was said with initial ill intent or not, the members of a peerage were dubbed a king's servants before long. As time went on, and this practice enhanced the devil world with new types of people and ideas, a new found game was created by the devils of the underworld, using illusion and temporary reality creating abilities, this idea surrounded around the idea of a game to battle two kings and their peerages against one another, this was to offer entertainment for the masses, as well as an opportunity for devils to advance in society. The rating game, but more on that later, back to the present. Rias Gremory challenged her old friend with her desire to enhance her peerage with a new member, currently, her member count consisted of four servants, with Akano being her queen, Kaniko being her rook, Kiba being her knight and Gaspar being her bishop, sadly, Gaspar was hardly useful at the current moment, Naruto would even attest to that, so, at the moment, the legendary devil house Gremory's heir was very limited in her number of working pieces. This wasn't just a matter of pride to her and why she had very few members to her peerage, who, on a secret way of basis, formed the membership of the occult research club, but also out of respect, eventually, Rias would be expected to participate in the world of devils, and she needed a full team, her current one was sorely lacking in numbers and strength. Naruto didn't approve of certain aspects to the system. Most notably, it was when members of a peerage were given the title of servant. It wasn't much to grow angry towards, but had heard the word said too many times in the underworld, with it being used more often than not as an insult, that he felt aggressive to it, it wasn't by a large number, but it was a number he saw that affected other peerage members differently, Naruto could take the hits and blows, had dealt with ridicule, once, he knew what it felt like, but insult those he cared about. I know you don't like the system, Naruto, it's not perfect, Rias spoke up, continuing from where she left off, but I hoped you would realize that I am not exactly in a position to ignore potential powerhouses right now, I am low on players for my side of the board, if Issei is powerful, I could really use that power now. He deserved a chance, Naruto stated, recovering from Rias calling on his miswording, his voice, thankfully, was the same level of even it was before, he deserved the right to choose if he wanted to be a devil, he deserved to not be seen as only a piece on your board. His tone rose, and he saw Rias grimace, good, that was one for him. I am not barring the system, Naruto cleared up, before Rias could jump on that perceived ideal. It's done more good than bad but if we start taking people without offering them a chance to say yes or no in the first place, we aren't any better than the devils who take their members to the underworld, it wasn't unheard of for someone to have died and been forcibly revived by a devil, looking for his or her power to add to his or her peerage, it was, thankfully, not looked positively upon, and the underworld was changing for the better in the treatment of peerage members. But a slow road to change meant suffering until then. And Rias did not want to be compared to those grave robbers, and I agree. He did deserve that, all of that, she countered, but with that fallen angel nipping at Hyodo San's sides, I couldn't get close without causing a situation, it seemed reasonable. Who just wants to die because of some fearful bird without provocation? If I brought him back, he would have a chance of a longer, even more successful life, she shook her head, falling to her seat, she ran fingers through her hair, agitated, we're running out of time, Naruto, I don't do bad things because they are easy, not intentionally, I do them because they are necessary, and we both know what's coming up, and if you aren't going to help me, actively, then desperate methods are needed, I can't stop this alone and we know it. Rias put heavy emphasis into her words, she hoped they reached him, stubborn, though, he could be. Naruto crossed his arms, taking a step back, of course he knew what she was talking about, it was something Naruto spent nights thinking about how to get around, desperate to find answers, as a favor to her. But still, winning a war at the sacrifice of good people and morality isn't how we do things. He told her, I promised I would help you, but these actions aren't how we go about winning or getting ahead. Not when the methods mean the sacrifice of who you are in the process. He uncrossed his arms, moving up to the desk and leaning over it to look at the president at eye level. I am not happy about you trying to go behind my back with this. In fact, I'd say I am disappointed more than anything. Rias' eyes narrowed, as she opened her mouth to retort before Naruto spoke over her. 
But you're desperate, I can. Relate to how that can make even smart people do things they wouldn't usually. So this time, Il let it go. For the first time since entering the room, Naruto's lips offered a hint of a smile. You're strong. Rias Chan. Despite herself, Rias offered a small smile at the Chan part. Good to know he was still willing to call her that. You're stronger than people give you credit for. Don't forget that. Well figure out what to do, in an honest way, and when we do, well talk about this, years from now, and laugh. She let her tense features loosen somewhat. Maybe this wasn't as bad as I thought. All right, all right, he'll believe it when I see it. She shook her head, letting a small smile cross her face as Naruto's smile brightened a little more. She stared at him kindly, speaking of honesty. However, I must ask, what about you? You fought the fallen angel, was it really to just save your classmate? Ah, she heard that, he thought, looking at her, she looked more relaxed now that this fight was, sort of, out of way, her eyes were innocent, she'd believe him, no matter what he said. Yeah, it was, Naruto answered, I saw the angel and went to see if there was in any trouble, turns out, there was, he offered a shrug and a smile, and Rias giggled at his nonchalant attitude, lying like this made him ill, if only because of how easy she believed him, but he had no choice, something was going on with his employer. Before he dragged his friends into anything potentially war-inducing, he wanted to figure out what exactly it was. But the way Rias held such faith in the idea he was telling the truth. All right, good to know, good to know, Rias laughed loudly, knocking the blonde youth from his silent musing as he stared up to her bright features, Rias let her arms stretch out above her, letting what remained of the tension die with a couple of cracks in her shoulders, now then, I don't suppose you could send the others back in, would you? I think it's about time we started getting our orders settled for the evening. Naruto nodded, the flyers, like the one he found in Issei's pocket, were meant to offer humans a way of summoning one of Rias' peerage to them to perform any action or request with their power. Magical, physical or otherwise, it was a way for devils to rise in ranks and power as an interesting method of service giving, as a completed pact or contract between a human and a devil gave the devil some small amount of energy by the human, which was easily recoverable by the human but was precious to a devil as a means of enhancing their powers, slowly but surely. Yeah yeah, ill get em, Naruto said, letting himself relax as he walked out the door, naturally, Rias Peerage was waiting, sitting in chairs and on a small couch in the hallway, Naruto pointed a thumb at Rias through the door, shall see you now. Perhaps noticing Naruto's much lighter mood, Kiba's worried expression faded as he stood and made to get to their nightly duties, Akano slowly walked by Naruto giving a quick hand squeeze in appreciation that nothing was broken, before following along with Kiba. Naruto smiled at Akino's pleased look, before he felt a tug on his arm, looking down, Kaneko held out her arm to him. Out of candy, she said, give me more, Naruto blinked, I don't have candy. She stared at him, yes you do, uh, no, I don't, I gave some to Gasper a week ago, but. Give me candy, I am telling you, I haven't had time to pick up any more. Give me candy, he stared at her, I don't have candy, he held out his hands, you could strip me and you won't even find a Tootsie Roll. Did someone say strip? No, Akano, Kaneko stared at Naruto hard, you don't have candy? No, I am out, she stared at him for a long moment, I greatly dislike you at the moment, Naruto-san. Kaneko lowered her arm, staring at the blonde for only a moment before walking around the somewhat stunned young man and entering the club room quietly closing the door with a loud slam after. Naruto stared quietly at the closed door for a few brief moments, silently, he wondered how someone who hardly smiled or expressed emotion beyond a desire for sugary goodness could sound so angry, monotone voice and all. It was hard to please his girls, Granny Yu, S, as breakfast and brunch diner, two miles from Kuo Academy, next day, 7.23 a.m. Mr. Doh C enjoyed his Tuesday breakfast like any man should. He enjoyed his coffee, he enjoyed his toast, he enjoyed the sound of bacon grilling on a stove. The whole concept of breakfast was a near obsession to the man, in fact, it was his dream, simple as it might have been, to travel the world and try every breakfast there was, an odd dream, to be sure, but it didn't stop there, he wanted lunch, too, and dinner. He wanted barbecues and airline food and multi-course meals and second breakfasts, which he was certain was not the same as having a second meal during breakfast, but something else entirely. He wanted to try the vast world of food that was open to him, and if that put him into a negative light, so be it. He more than earned his position to be a glutton, if he did say so himself. At the moment, on that particular morning, Mr. Dosi was walking into a suave, if he was so bold as to call it, 
diner around the corner from his little home in the city. The diner was called Granny U.S. as breakfast and brunch diner, or Granny's, as was the simpler name. Mr. Doe H.C. was quite fond of Granny's, going into the place, he felt younger. The diner was always lit and serving wonderful scents. The workers always seemed the same. A waitress, a cook and the owner, who helped serve coffee to his favorite customers, himself. The atmosphere was vibrant and warm and a bright light from the outside world, with today in particular starting off rainy and a bit dreary for Mr. Doe H.C.'s taste. In truth, he came to the diner every two weeks, ever since he came to town, to try their new, bi-weekly specials, they were always large, delectable treats, smothered in whatever sugary product the cook could find, in fact, Mr. Doe H.C. would even go so far as to say the man was an artist, for such a small business, the cook truly flourished with his spatula and whisk, he prided himself in the names of his works, the new techniques he thought up, and the designs, oh. The designs, of his masterpieces could make high-class chefs tremble in magnificence to his passion and ingenuity. Indeed, no place on earth, at least to Mr. Doe H.C., was like Granny's, it was his reprieve, his haven, from the troubles of his world, it was his peace of mind and the place to fill his unfulfilled taste buds. Walking in, after ensuring no drops of rain would besmirch the sacred ground of Granny's, Mr. Doe H.C., with his commonly worn grey trench coat and snazzy black fedora, walked in with a smile. Good morning. Mr. Doe H.C. yelled, making his presence known to the few early breakfast eaters and workers in the room, who turned around to stare at the brightly cheerful man and replied back. Good morning. It was a common practice of Mr. Doe H.C.'s when he walked into Granny's, smiling to himself with an absolutely jolly laugh and kicked to his step as he made his way to the front counter. The owner was already there, waiting for him, as they both smiled to one another, Good morning to you, Mr. Doe H.C. And good morning to you. My good man Freddy. Mr. Doe H.C. replied back fondly to the Japanese-speaking American, a fairly large, balding but jolly-looking elderly man who went by the name Frederick but reserved Freddy for his close friends, as they exchanged their bi-weekly greeting with smiles and no small amount of chuckles, and what might I be expecting for this week's special? The anticipation in his favorite routine customer's voice made the owner glow with pride, ah, er gonna be happy with this week's. Yasuo's really outdone himself, ya yeah, here. Yasuo. A man in his early twenties with tan skin, a tall build and a growing goatee turned from his stove behind Mr. Freddy and gave a friendly wave to their frequent customer. Mr. Doe H.C. waved back, well that sounds wonderful. Get me one of those, he yelled, earning a bark of laughter from both men behind the counter. Already ordered, Freddy replied, er friend ordered it for ya twenty minutes ago. There was a pause in the jolly feeling in the air, Mr. Doe H.C. blinked, still smiling, my friend? I. That guy in our spot over there. Mr. Doe H.C. turned to where the elderly Mons finger pointed, been waiting for you to arrive all morning. Says had a friend of yours. Freddy paused then. Uh. He is our friend, yes? Mr. Doe H.C. stared at the young man in his spot, who turned his head to him and waved, smiling. Mr. Doe H.C. didn't smile or wave, just turning back to the owner of the diner and offering a small smile. He is an acquaintance, yes? Freddy stared at him curiously. Yeah sure. His customer nodded slowly, looking slightly uncomfortable as Freddy looked over Mr. Doe H.C. carefully, looking for lies, after a moment, he nodded, well, all right, if you say so, he gave a nudge towards the man in Mr. Doe H.C.'s regular spot, I'll have Katsumi send for er drinks, soon. That sounds lovely, thank you, Mr. Doe H.C. turned, the wind seemingly out of his bright, cheerful sails, and walked over to the teenager in his spot of the diner. Naruto watched as Mr. Doe H.C. approached him carefully, despite the mon's tense walk, Naruto appeared quite cheerful and relaxed, even as Mr. Doe H.C. sat in the booth opposite of him, Naruto just smiled. Then, as was respectable, the new occupant to the booth offered his hellos, first. Naruto, he greeted, taking off his hat and placing it to the side, his cheerful mood seemed dulled now. Donisik, Naruto greeted in return, watching as the man shifted irritably in his spot, he didn't, apparently, like to be called out by his real name. Despite what the occupants of the small diner were aware of, in truth, the man sitting in front of Naruto was the fallen angel Donisik, a lower rank member of the fallen angel society but a man of considerable knowledge and worth, nonetheless, Mr. Doe H.C. was a play on the trench coat wearing Mont's name, of course, appearing as a rugged, middle-aged man, Donisik took pride, in what Naruto called, his boy cosplayed Carmen San Diego outfit. He thought he looked cool, Naruto just laughed, 
But back to the present, Naruto watched the man look around to see if anyone heard Naruto's addressing him by his true name, they didn't, Naruto was sure of it. It's been a while, Donaseek, Mr. Dohc, replied, trying to regain his composure, he didn't like the sanctity of his small paradise ruined by anyone, especially someone like Naruto. It has, how's life on your side of life, hum? Still the, oh, what was it again? The lapdog of Gremory. Donazik's presence was starting to feel hostile, though his face was still a mask of confidence and calm, insulting the blonde was a way to try and cool himself off. Who knew he was such a territorial wreck? Still, Naruto's smile dropped, I hate that name. And yet, it's a surprisingly accurate one, he said, this time letting out a small grin as he dug into the blonde, his invasion of privacy was going too far, though he wouldn't say it, usually, he was more cordial, but Granny's was his place, not Naruto's, or any other angels or devils, for that matter. But again, Donaseek found insults calming, he couldn't outright yell at Naruto in the diner, that would cause a scene he didn't want, Naruto accepted his penchant for foul words in the brief time had known the fallen angel, all Naruto could do was clench his fist and ignore him. So, the fedora-wearing bastard spoke up, reaching for a menu and looking over the pictures of delectable substances on it, helping to calm him, how have you been holding up lately, hum? No insult, he was accepting the blonde, hopefully, fine, Naruto admitted, I've been doing side jobs wherever I can find M when Rias isn't nipping for me to go full time for her. Mr. Dohc nodded, figuring as much, from the time had known Naruto, had realized the boy intensely enjoyed his little work on the side, certainly enjoying it more than his regular routine of earning an education at the city's fine public institute of learning or being the Gremory's bitch. In his brief time of being familiar with the youth, the fallen angel would admit to some understanding of the child's need for excitement or an alteration from common sights or backgrounds, a little time away from home did wonders, as any fallen angel would attest to, as well. In the case of the blonde, the boy's little business escapades gave him both financial retinue and adventure all at once, and with his unique standard of skills, he was well worth the price for anything anyone was willing to pay for. Mr. Dohc wouldn't admit this much to anyone, however, and so continued to instead look over his menu, making good money, he casually asked. Naruto slouched in his booth, no, he groaned, throwing his hands through his hair, irritably, as Donaseek raised a curious eyebrow. I keep working for free because of some sob story they keep selling me, either that, or I owe someone a favor, the blonde laid back further in his seat, so no, not good money. Hum. The angel responded without little care, returning his attention back to a delicious looking pancake at the bottom of his menu and trying to contain the drool slowly building in his mouth. Naruto watched the mon's odd fascination with the plastic diner item. What about you? He asked, breaking the silence, job hunting again. This seemed to knock the fun out him, yeah, got axed last week at the McRonald's up near the church, accidentally ate half their storage, he shrugged, trying to blow the failure off, though he owed rent this coming week, not all fallen angels were exactly loaded, lasted three weeks, though, he admitted lastly, which to him was very good news. And apparently, news to Naruto, three weeks. Donaseek paused in his reading, he knew where the blonde was going with this, don't. No, seriously, three? Bite me. What's that, like, three days over your record? Do you get a button for that? S should I throw you a party? The playful joshing was not to the angel's liking, Donaseek was a proud man. Admitting or even playfully mentioning his shortcomings in any sort of negative light was, perhaps, one of his truly great weaknesses. Shown all the more when he slammed his menu onto the table, meeting the blonde's blue eyes with his steely own, I will leave, right, now. Who's Rainer? And like that, before it could start, Donazik's tirade was cut short by the interruption, Naruto studied him, watching as the the angel's face loosened and slacked at the reference to the name, before, the playful jabbing had been fun but now it was time to get the answers to his questions. Which is roughly when Katsumi the waitress came walking up to their small table, Mr. Dohc, it's great to see you again. Mr. Dohc's attention immediately switched from Naruto to the waitress, smiling brightly, same, my dear, how are you? I've been doing wonderful, thank you, she replied, as Mr. Dohc noticed a subtle glance on her part back to the cook behind the counter, he kept his knowing smile hidden. Oh, don't you mention it, he lifted up his menu again, pretending he hadn't memorized every inch of the menu several times over, before smiling back to the young woman, ill just have a coffee, plenty of cream and sugar, of course. Of course. Katsumi knew that was his usual, he was such a sweet gentleman, always so kind. 
Shed worked her for a long time but never knew anyone who could brighten an early morning like him, and for you, young man. Hell have a bottle. Donasik answered for the blonde before Naruto could even open his mouth. Katsumi blinked. What? The fallen only smiled, a water bottle, he told me himself, he smiled brightly, as Katsumi smiled back and nodded, writing it down on a notepad before moving back behind the counter. Donasik turned to the now annoyed blonde, he smiled to him, Naruto kicked him under the booth. Ow. Who's Rainer, pimp dick? Naruto asked grumpily, losing his temper while remembering why he hardly hung with the only semi-reasonable angel he knew. And that was because he was only semi-reasonable, how do you know her? She isn't in the normal fallen garrison stationed in Japan, I know, I checked, so what is she? Donasik was still rubbing his hurt ankle, and why should I tell you anything? Naruto was ready with the favor owed, because of that little problem you let loose near the Vatican. Donasik, to his credit and irritation, had the good grace to look surprised, oh, right, that, with the tentacles in the slime in the, right, right, forgot about that. Naruto stared at him. How could you forget the hundreds of angels that descended to pierce my rear hind full of holy spears? How could you forget how that thing nearly poisoned the entire ecosystem of the Mediterranean? How could you forget meeting the Pope? It was a Tuesday, right? Donna. Fine, fine. Shish. He whispered harshly, again scanning the cafe for anyone who might have heard him, just remember I can't tell you everything, right? Security reasons, you understand. Naruto nodded, both in understanding and finally getting somewhere. This was the Donasik he preferred, then what can you tell me? The angel paused, looking up to the ceiling as he seemed to gather his thoughts on the elusive Ms. Rainer. Rainer was born of the union of two fallen angels, the product of their sin of lust. Parents died by Manticore when she was young around the First World War, passed on to Azazel's care soon after, been looking after her ever since. Naruto nodded as he listened, this was good, simple, but information was good, anything else? Donasik stroked his chin, uh. Yeah. I remember she had the good old sin of pride keeping her from the topside, but recently. She's got the sin of wrath burning in her, don't know what brought it up but it's been bad for a while, not many fallen like those wrath types, can get a little too on edge for our tastes. Naruto listened carefully, sins of pride, wrath, lust. Each fallen angel had an abundance of a seven deadly sin in them, they organized and related themselves by this code, some were extreme cases, some were mild, some changed to different forms of sin over time, it wasn't uncommon and was accepted because that was just who they were. And now, a wrathful fallen angel was running amok, awesome. But one thing caught his attention, you're not a wrathful fallen? Donasik stared at him, I am a glutton, that's my sin, I enjoy my food, there's nothing wrong with that. And the occasional bloodbath, from what I hear, Donasik thought on that, well, a good fight now and then does keep life interesting. Figures, so, Reynare's just angry, Oh, she's a gas tank put too close to hellfire. Never know when she's gonna blow. And she's recently developed a bit of a sadistic streak to go along with it. Azazel's been keeping her on a short leash, keeping her on earth and out of the underworld, and she's none too happy about it, been lashing out, from what I heard. Whatever he heard was right, doesn't sound like the most harmonious relationship between the two. Oh. Rainer worships the ground Azazel walks on. The angel exclaimed, and Azazel is about as doting as a surrogate father can get. But that doesn't mean it's all hunky dory here on earth, she feels she's entitled to a higher position than whatever Azazel's got her doing, and she's very vocal about it. Donasik sighed, seemingly getting his high from staring at a breakfast menu, before putting it down and staring at the blonde, so, what's got your interest in her? It was a legitimate question, one Naruto had no problem answering, she tried to jump in on a job of mine. Oh. Didn't kill her, you never do, but this whole situation with her has left me on edge, Naruto admitted looking out the window of the diner to the rain. There was something he didn't understand yet, why stop Rainer? From what he got, Azazel would have preferred if Issei died, the boy was dangerous, whatever he had in him, it was a risk, so why not deal with it? It might have been the ninja in him, but a risk that could threaten an entire faction was something to put down, it was harsh, but reality. He closed his eyes in irritation, groaning silently. This situation was all so political, all right, gentlemen. A female yell came from Naruto's side, waking him as his eyes widened, a water for you, one coffee for you, and, the largest plate Naruto had ever seen came crashing down in front of Donasik, easily being half the size of the table, one special for our favorite customer. Donasik looked like he won the lottery, his eyes were watering. The All-American Freedom Special. 
A large pancake topped off with syrup, bacon, hash browns, sausage, cream, sugary powder, scrambled eggs, all of which seemed to be placed accordingly to make it seem, in an almost impossible way, like a bald eagle was sitting comfortable in front of the United States flag. Naruto stared at him, the mess of food, then back to him, really? Really? Donaseek pulled a fork from his pocket and stabbed it into a sausage, he seemed to melt from the taste. It's American, he practically cried, quickly taking another bite, by the way, you're paying for this, be sure to leave a big tip. Outskirts of Kuo Academy, next day, Wednesday, 5.24 p.m. Kuo Academy, for Naruto Uzumaki, academy life was an interesting endeavor, this was in no small part due to academy students being held at high standards of exceptional ability, it, in turn, required Naruto to show some similar levels of enthusiasm and determination to excel, this wasn't exactly easy. Naruto passed a basic academy life before, was educated and learned from several esteemed teachers and scholars, and while the material of this new world was different, history alone was fascinating. The task of actually staying in a seat for several hours a day, listening and doodling down what was heard, was not enjoyable. When he was Hokage, sitting in a chair, mulling over his village's needs and wants was far easier than this. He was a mature man in the body of a youth, he felt the innovation. The determination and the desire to want to explore and move. That might have been coupled to what a youth's natural desire was. But it certainly passed on to the old man and his new body. He wanted to travel and climb mountains and seek out vast forests. He wanted the move away from stone buildings and mass crowds. If only for a little while, he didn't boast to being spoiled, he simply wanted the desire to move beyond the confines his family had placed on him, he was educated with an intelligence developed over decades of learning, so while the history lessons did, occasionally, catch his attention, his lack of interest in mathematics and subjects of government were justified because, frankly, had probably learned about the individual subjects prior. This lack of attentiveness in matters of the school was often the reason behind his extension of services to certain parties and individuals soon into his Kuo Academy career. This was, in part, for the need to move beyond the small Japanese city and for the nostalgia that came with accepting assignments from individuals who would gladly pay you for services rendered, in other words, to accept missions that had a completion chance based on Naruto's ever-growing and returning skill set. The missions were vast and wildly over-the-top tasks that pushed his abilities, it was the closest he felt to being an actual ninja again. His escapades weren't well advertised, for good reason. Donaseek knew of them because he was one of the few angels he was amiable towards. Last thing he needed was the constant messaging, asking him to do the most minute tasks, had created a network of connections and ideas through the world, simply from extending an offer or hand to the right person at the right time, Jiraiya would have been proud, and his assignment-taking opportunities weren't limited to a race, he took projects from all manner of being, he met fascinating people while on the job. Gods, monsters, legendary figures of mythologies and so on who held no shortage of work for him. Beyond the excitement of danger and risk that came from his work, Naruto quite enjoyed his time away on the curious jobs he was offered, it was something to connect himself back to his younger, more active life, he felt as spry as a child in the snow and as combat ready as he felt in his prime. But there was another, perhaps more psychological reasoning behind his work. Simply put, Naruto Uzumaki wasn't sure what he was doing. Why had he returned from death? Why was he taken in by the devils? Why did he find himself in such a bizarre set of worlds that was similar and heavily contrasting to his home? There had to be a purpose, some clue, no one just brings someone back to life without some idea as to the reasoning, in fact, had fought people who'd been brought back from the dead, before. They held a single purpose to fight and die for a cause, often one they did not desire to fight for, but Naruto felt no such pull, no strings or attachments or meddling with his head that suggested he should do something that wasn't what he would normally do, he certainly didn't look dead. All skin and eye colorations were the same as he had before his passing. So, beyond being an assist to his friends, engaging in a learning system he felt little interest in, and performing tasks mortal, and even immortal, men could not believe, what was he to do? What would spur someone, if it was, indeed, someone, to bring him back without provocation or purpose? It was those questions that made sleeping difficult. Ring ring. Ring ring. Ring ring. But life went on, no different than usual. Reaching into his pocket, Naruto flipped open the small device. Place in the Sun 1903 Passenger Drive, Stray Devil Request, Capture, Elimination. Reward. 100,000. Accept, Reject. Naruto stared at the message. First, password accepted. Good, second. 
Location. It was close. A couple hours walk. Maybe. Nice large mansion. Easy to find. Third. Stray devil. That made him smile. They knew some of his favorite game. Fourth. Capture or eliminate. New customer. He guessed. Fifth. Yuan 100,000. Someone was being cheap. Still, no additional info or some sob story. He could work with that. Might actually get paid for once. Shrugging, Naruto clicked accept and kept walking. Outskirts of the city, 8.37 p.m. Stray devils. Reincarnated devils. Peerage members, who turned on their king and killed him or her. Without their masters to keep them in check, they posed a real threat, not only to the underworld, but to all factions and beings they come into contact with. It was a common occurrence for strays to be wild and demented in thought, commonly attacking anything that moved, be they sentient or otherwise, whether it was from power lust, mental instability or other negative reasonings for attacking their masters, strays never had a good reputation among anyone. Devils were sent by the high lords to deal with them. Internal matters of state, as they were, no matter the country. The nearest devil peerage or hunter would be directed after the rogue so as to preserve the order of the human world and reputation of the devil peerage system, the reputation, being, you go astray, you die, perhaps not poetic, but it was persuasive, less strays were occurring then when the initial activation of the peerage system began, though the possibility of occurrence wasn't completely eliminated, fixing the peerage system from its initial basis seemed to be helping. Though, on occasion, the stray devil was elusive, sometimes, a stray knew how to stay out of a devil authority's spotlight, and when that happened, it was bad news for whatever occupied area it decided to hold up at. Usually creating rumors of a cave, forest or an old abandoned homestead that they decided to make their home out of, either it was haunted, possessed or just plain creepy, the self-made rumors kept people away for the most part, only the truly brave or stupid decided to go looking into the rumors themselves. Often, they never found the devil, hiding was a full-life occupation now, scaring a few humans, who were only looking to explore a deemed haunted area, was hardly a risk worth taking, lest they be caught and dealt with harshly. But, sometimes, the humans just wouldn't stay away. Sometimes, a devil got hungry, and when devils were incapable of finding their lost societal members, it was up to the hunters to do their jobs, hunters, as their name suggested, hunted the scum of the supernatural, mythological, fantastical and so on, they weren't an organized group. Most preferring solitude or small groups as opposed to large working organizations, freelance, they were the humans who still remembered the old times between humanity and devilkind and realized the limitations of the human body. They were few and far between and although Naruto wouldn't officially call himself a hunter he did like the sound of going up against things that went bump in the night. This was one of his favorite gigs, going up against rogue devils, just like way back when. Arriving at the large estate mansion, Naruto marveled at its bulk and size, the mansion was definitely well constructed, almost as large as the main building at Kuo, its construct was made with white walls, tinted windows and large front wooden doors, it appeared easy to move into, with a large amount of space inside, Naruto found it cozy, if he were astray looking for a place to accommodate, he could have done worse. Sadly, the mansion was also a very well-known location, rumors of its haunting were widespread, starting up a couple months prior with the family of the estate moving out unexpectedly, but not taken for much else than school gossip. Then people went missing, if Naruto hadn't been occupied with Issei, he might have stoked the place out before today. But now, he was getting paid to do something he would have eventually done on his own. Guess someone's looking out for this guy. Naruto thought pleasantly, as he made a quick leap over the gate to the mansion, casually landing before walking a brisk pace to the front door, don't see anyone on the outside, figured as much. The wooden doors were mahogany, their designs were quite appreciative to the eye, clearly. They were handcrafted and had the time and passion of an artist's touch put into them, smooth to the touch, appreciatively waxed and delicately polished by former house caretakers of the former owners. Bang! Naruto ripped them off their hinges with a well-placed kick, he never lost his smile. Walking in casually, Naruto marveled at the design of the mansion, roomy, piano in the corner, fine white design space, windows that looked out over a large patio and that view hot damn. If that stray wasn't going to use the place after Naruto was finished with him, he might just take the place himself. Naruto's footsteps made audible echoes in the homestead. Making his presence known, walking towards the center of the floor, he waited as he tried to make out any obstruction in the silence around him. It didn't take long, I smell something, a raspy, feminine voice whispered around Naruto, as the room's only source of light, the moon, went casually behind a set of clouds. An echo of hard footsteps could be heard from up the marble staircase, 
growing louder with each step. I smell something good, Naruto glanced towards the top of the staircase, making out a looming form, even in the dimmed moonlight. I wonder if it's crunchy, I wonder if it's sweet, bitter, perhaps? The face of a beautiful woman loomed out of the shadow, smiling and peering down to the intruder in her abode, her skin was pale. Dark hair ran down her back, eyes a bright yellowish green and her torso, naked, she wore no shirt nor apparently any other mesh of clothing, she was full fronting the blonde without care to the situation. Naruto, had he been a male of lust or perversion, might have appreciated the view, as it stood, he knew what was happening, and didn't allow himself to turn away embarrassed, even in confidence, the situation could change to deadly in a moment. So, instead, keeping his eyes on her, he smiled, am I interrupting you? He gestured to her dress, or lack of it. The woman chuckled, sweet, y-e-s-s-s-s, certainly, hungry now, your a-n-a-p-p-a-t-i-z-e-r. Before Naruto could make a quip about how, certainly, he was main course worthy, the rest of the woman's body stepped out from the staircase. Naruto, despite himself, felt a little bit of himself throw up in his mouth, though it is said beauty is to the beholder, Naruto had to wonder who saw this as beautiful. The stray's entire lower body was that of a brown-haired beast of some sort. Her legs were arms and hands finished sharp claws and painted a strange pink. Her tail shook with anticipation. A short thing with a ball of hair at the end, to Naruto, this was bizarre because he never saw devils like this before, a weird combination of parts from different species, but that wasn't the worst part, from her crotch to the valley between her breasts, the stray had a line down the middle, which opened and closed like it was chewing something crunchy from within, long, gray teeth were easily made out from within, as they gargled on something tastily. The stray smiled menacingly, her teeth seemed to sharpen disgustingly as she looked over the blonde with delight. Naruto stared at her, wow, okay, I have seen some fugly things in my life, but you? He looked her over again, you are definitely in my top 10 freaky things list, and this counted for both lives. The stray just smiled, unperturbed as she decided to play with her breasts, excited. Oh great, an exhibitionist, wonderful, silly child, what would you know of true beauty? You are but an arrogant, short-lived, primitively naive human. Oh, you sweet talker, you. Unlike your race, this perfect body and form will stay with me forever. Ouch. Sorry to hear that, while yours withers and decays. To one such as I, you are maggot food at its finest. Wait, did you just call yourself a maggot? Now, gaze upon the majesty that is I, the wondrous visor, lady of hell, as she makes you a part of her. Uh, wait, hell? You mean the underworld, right? I know those two are a common misconception, but I've actually been to oh crap. Naruto leapt to the side, avoiding a spray of pale liquid that shot towards him, hitting the ground where he stood and evaporating it quickly. Naruto glanced to the spot then back to where the liquid shot from, you have breast acid? Seriously? Screw making the top 10. You just made the whole freaky list, top to bottom. He dodged again, avoiding more acid as the stray seemed to be enjoying herself. Ahahahaha. Stay still, you little cretin, so I may finish you off quickly. Careful. You keep talking like that, dodge, and people are gonna talk, dodge, and I am not saying you aren't the world's biggest eyesore, but, dodge, 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 you're the world's biggest eyesore. Naruto leapt behind the piano, watching as the breast acid attack finally ended, whether she was out or finally got her high off the exhibitionist work was anyone's guess. Looking over the piano, Naruto ran his fingers over the framework, sorry, Beethoven. Toss. Ahaha da. Direct hit, the piano smashed into several pieces at the impact of the stray's enhanced endurance, as the once cackling monster fell to the ground, obviously damaged. You know, this would probably be where I choose a joke around a piano and an ugly woman, Naruto's voice yelled around the center room, his presence unseen as the stray stood once more, attempting to gain composure, despite the injury, but for the love of me, I just can't figure out which one to choose from. The devil, now snarling, was getting serious, where are you? Come out, come out, you worm. Worm? I thought I was a cretin, or maggot food. Do you have a thing for bugs? Cause I knew this one guy who had a thing for bugs and he. Silence. The stray shouted, turning and glancing in all directions of the room. Where are you? Do you think this is some kind of game? Yahtzee. Be silent. Be silent, now. Ori will pull your head off and feed it to my stomach. And you made it awkward, ba og h h h h h. 
Naruto looked down from his position on the ceiling of the room, his feet holding himself in air as if stuck to the room's top, all the while, he was smiling as the stray attempted to find his missing person, in most situations, he would have taken this seriously, heck, he would have had a nice conversation and everything, but, the week till now had been tense, boring and lacking in any decent workout, so this job was the perfect relaxant. Plus, this stray didn't seem like a few of the others had met, ones abused or used by their masters in twisted schemes for power or pleasure, this stray, visor, got off on what she was doing. So, it was time to end it, now, letting the energy holding his feet to the ceiling release him, Naruto brought his fist back as he dropped to the stray devil, only revealing his presence at the last possible moment so that the stray turned her head to look up to her incoming attacker. The stray's eyes widened as she barely made out the boy before he finished her for the evening, but one thing did strike her, besides the blow to the face, that left her questioning if she imagined what she saw before the embrace of forced unconsciousness took her. Red? Outskirts of the city, 9.02 p.m. Rias Gremory assembled her peerage outside of the abandoned mansion, her servants each had their personal weapons and effects ready for the assault, she was mentally readying herself, as well, even weak strays could prove bothersome, they did kill their high-class masters, after all. An hour before, Akano received a message from the underworld, requesting she and her peerage deal with recent reports on a stray in the local area, this was fine to her, this wasn't the first stray she and her peerage had dealt with, though she wished Kiba had managed to get Naruto on the line to join them, he enjoyed the hunt. But, perhaps his absence was for the best, when Naruto was involved, he rarely held back and allowed her fellow members to pursue their target, instead, he preferred singling the stray out and taking him or her on alone, often with clever quips to the bemusement of Kiba and Akino. Today, though, was different, now, at least, she could say she tried to get the blonde's notice before the attempt, while at the same time giving her peerage the chance to experience a stray on their own, without the rather combat savvy and enjoying Naruto, admittedly, that may have been a little exciting, proving herself, without the blonde's talent or assistance, it felt good. Smiling to herself, Rias waved her hands to the mansion's gates, opening them slowly. Kiba, her knight, and Kaneko, her rook, took point as she and Akano walked behind, looking over the estate curiously, looking at the knock-down front doors, Rias wondered if the stray was asking to be caught, that was a little too eye-catching to be ignored. The four of them walked in, confident in their abilities, a knight, a rook, a queen and a gremory would be more than enough for one stray. At least, that was the idea, then they came to the post-combat mess left by the devil. On the ground, unconscious and groaning in its sleep, was the stray, naked from the top up, the only way the peerage was even sure it was alive was by its slow breathing, followed by its moans, its face was beaten and was bleeding out of its nose and mouth, though not to a level of worry for even a stray devil, it was, simply, sleeping off the pain. And on top of its form, sitting cross-legged over his conquered foe was Naruto, writing something on a small piece of paper with a fixed focus. Rias and her peerage stared at him, let's see, seven meters tall, quadrupedal form, full nude, Naruto scratched his head with the pen in his hand, looking confused before glancing up to the company, hey, Kaneko, what do you think she is? One ton? Two tons? One and a half, Kaneko answered, still looking onto the weird occurrence. Thanks. Naruto said brightly, scribbling again as he made his little symbols and markings on the small parchment of paper no larger than his hand before hopping off the slumbering stray, moving towards its head, and placing the slip of paper to its forehead. Focusing. Naruto felt the familiar pull of internal energy in him, as the paper's runic seals glowed red with power, the room was lit with it, as the head from the stray slowly edged into the paper, seeming to twist and shrink as if it were sucked in, the head was followed by the torso, then the lower body, then the claws, before finally the small furball of the tail sank into the small piece of paper with an audible pop. Naruto, smiling, waved the paper in the air, letting the ink dry out, before turning to Rias peerage, they were still staring, yo. Kaneko lifted her hand in a wave, yo, Naruto. Rias yelled in the partially destroyed mansion, walking over to stare intensely at the now surprised looking blonde, what do you think you're doing here? Naruto stared back, confused and a bit worried at her sudden fury, uh, nothing? This wasn't the right answer to give, nothing? He pursed his lips, I went for a walk. Rias stared at him, you went for a walk? He nodded, another one. He nodded, this far from your apartment. He nodded, into, what just so happened to be, a stray devil's territory. I know, right? How lucky am I? Oh, she was gonna blow, he could see the outline of a red aura startling to encircle her form, 
He lifted up the sealed paper protectively, but I got you a present. See. He was smiling, slightly in panic to the furious woman, vaguely, with Rios' hair starting to swirl and twist as her power caused the wind around them to brush her hair wildly around. Naruto wondered if his, original, mother, who had similar colored hair and a temper to match, was like this when she was upset with his, original, father. Rios' glare was rarely used and even rarer to see her without some form of her demonic power seeping out with her loss of emotions, she was known as the crimson-haired ruin princess for a reason, her power was not to be trifled or tested with. Angry though she was, the way Naruto offered her his win placated her somewhat, maybe it was just a look of panic from the blonde that made her want to laugh and hug him at the same time, he was just so jovial it was cute, he beat a stray, single-handedly, and was whimpering to her like had done something wrong, it was hard to stay angry towards. In the end, grumbling, she wrenched the paper from his hand and turned back to her peerage, walking towards the door, Kiba was grinning sheepishly at the situation, Kaneko was monotonous, and Akano was hiding a giggle and smile behind her hand. Rias told herself she would get answers from Naruto, later, to save face. We're leaving, now, Rias ordered, not turning back at the image of Naruto, wiping his brow in relief at not being made to feel the princess of destructions, as she was also known as, Fury. Instead, she shouted back, with perhaps a small bit of enjoyment, and I am telling mother about this. Kiba followed his king, silently laughing as the sword he kept to his side vanished into particles of energy. Kaneko followed, looking annoyed at not getting the chance to punch anything, while Akano giggled more as she looked back to Naruto's expression. Lady Venelana, please, no, I was walking. Atop the mansion, a female, winged figure watched closely as the Grimori king and her peerage left, followed shortly by the blonde boy who seemed to lack the kick in his step that he came into the mansion with earlier. Rainer stared at him hard, Naruto, she thought, mulling the name over silently. She'd been staking the mansion for some time, after her humiliation days prior, Shed figured she needed an outlet for her pent-up frustration, a good fight, in her mind, would do her some good, and as it so happened, rumors during her time as a student at Kuo caught her attention, she hadn't meddled into them, her task had been the pervert, but now that she was free for a while. Then the blonde showed up. Funny as situations went. Running into the hero turned out better than she hoped. It was quite the show. The human boy thrashing the delusional stray devil with ease. If she hadn't known who the boy was prior to her arrival, she might have even congratulated him on a job well done. But then, instead of finishing the beast off, the blonde seemed to want to do nothing more than lay on top of his win, scribbling with a light pen onto a piece of parchment without care. This infuriated her, at first. To see he couldn't even finish the job was unbelievably droll, she planned to make herself known, then, just to rant and yell at his mercy, but then his cavalry arrived. It was intriguing what she heard, watching the devil disappear, watching the blonde cower from the red-headed devil woman, discovering the boy's name amidst the commotion, it was delightful pieces of information and ability she was content with simply viewing from a distance, partially, she hazarded the thought of surprise attacking them all. She wasn't discovered and her spears could still deal considerable damage, especially to the red devil and her peerage. But the friendly attitude between the human and the devils gave her pause, she was outnumbered and, dare she admit, outmatched, it was too much a risk. So, she watched them as they left, keeping an eye on them all as they disappeared in a flash of red from a teleport circle. When they were gone, and she was sure her presence hadn't been discovered, she took to the cool skies above, she had much to think about, above all, after the display of the blonde's humiliating and quick victory over the stray, Rainer realized she would need more power to see her goals met in the blonde, Naruto. Quivering at her feet, the thought made her smile, thanks for watching.